All right. Okay, folks. All right. So we are live here. So welcome to the uh, DB Cooper Sleuth uh, show, um, podcast show, whatever we want to call it. And uh, tonight uh, I am joined by my good friend, uh, Drew Beeson, uh, here, who is the uh, Braden aficionado. Um, he is the, the king of the Braden people. Um, I guess I consider myself one, you know, one of the Braden people. I'm, you know, Drew probably does too. Um, you know, there's a few of us who are, are pretty hardcore, you know, uh, Braden missionaries, uh, I suppose. I, I was out there preaching Braden for a long time because, um, you know, he just makes a lot of sense to me. And uh, I believe that Drew will probably get into that and how he, he and I came to uh, start talking about Ted and e emailing back and forth. And we've had just a good friendship about this. So we kind of see eye to eye on a lot of things with this. So anyway, so anyway, so uh, I'll just uh, open it up to, to Drew to just, I think a lot of people are new to, new to Ted. One of the things about Ted that I was talking about, uh, I was thinking about earlier when I was just thinking about Ted, is that one of the issues with, you know, Ted is that somebody asked in the, in the group, in the Facebook group, why is Ted Braden never featured in any documentaries? Why is he never, uh, you know, why do you never see him as a subject in these sort of things? Really, it's it's twofold, really, is that Ted became a suspect to the mainstream Cooper world, really with Bruce's book, I would say. Bruce has a chapter that's on Mac v. Sog, and Ted is a, key part of it. And then later on in the Andrew, in uh, Bruce's book, of course, he has, he actually communicates with Ted Braden uh, in the afterlife in one of his, uh, he has, he has a remote viewing session and uh, Ted tells him that he's not Cooper in his, in his vision, but a man named, uh, it was like Barry Sanders. What was the, I can't remember Walter, the uh, name he saw. I can't remember. It was some, it was I something like, it was some name that was like, a football player or something like Barry Sanders or Walter Payton yeah. or something. He but said he that that guy is another military. Saw, guy. Yeah. yeah. But that's, that's in, that's in uh, Bruce's book. But then really that was in 2015 or 2016. And then we show up, uh, then Drew's book comes out in 2020. Is that right, Drew? Yeah. Yeah. I think 2020 is right. 2020. And so, he's not been featured because he's really a relatively new suspect as far as like Cooper suspects go in the mainstream. He's, he's new. And the second reason why he's not featured until recently was the Wikipedia page. A lot of people are lazy when they go to make videos, when they go to make documentaries, they just go to the Wikipedia page. And so I believe it was in 2021, I finally got around. I added, maybe it was tw early 2022. I added Braden to the, Wikipedia page, and lo and behold, Braden starts showing up on Yahoo articles or BuzzFeed, all those typical clickbait articles about oh, DB Cooper. Ted starts showing up on those, so I think I don't, that that's not a coincidence. You. And when that happened, I didn't know it was you. And the first time I heard from you was when you emailed me years ago. I meant to go look up that date, and you said I'm a, a former uh, district attorney, and now you know I'm a criminal attorney, and I think you know Braden's the first. Uh, person I've ever read about it as far as a D.B. Cooper suspect that I would feel confident prosecuting just based on circumstantial evidence. And like you right. said, on the first time you did the vortex, you, you mentioned that, you know, how you Braden was the first one and, you know, you were a lurker on the message boards. But when you reached out to me and what a confidence boost it was to me uh, having, you know, a, an attorney reaching out that had done all this research and, and uh, that confidence level. So that was a big deal. You know, when you sent me that letter, that was a big part of it. And you've been a big part of Team Ted and uh, got, getting him on Wikipedia. Like I said, I didn't know that I didn't put it two and I can't remember how I put two and two together that you were the one that added them. But when I saw it show up, I was elated to say the least when you when you got him on Wikipedia. And of course, he shows up first because it's alphabetical order. So that's kind yeah, of that helps. <laughs> that too. Help. I thought about that, too. Yeah, Ted, Ted does show up first. But yeah, I did. Uh, you know, I have a different take on, you know, I do support, for example, a lot of people may know that I like uh, Vordal as a suspect. If the, if the type particles are what they say they are, I think he's as good a suspect as you could get from that alone. But I've never, but I, the problem with someone like Milton and, and as, as a prosecutor is most folks don't just wake up one morning and commit a capital crime. Um, most folks don't just, most folks don't do that. So Ted, 
you know, most of these suspects in the Cooper world are not people who would wake up one morning and hijack a plane. And as a prosecutor, generally your criminals are criminals. That's just the way it is. And studying hijackers, they were criminals or they were mentally, mentally ill. So when Ted came along, I said, wait, this guy's got the skill set, but he's also a legitimate criminal. Uh, this guy was not a good person, I would say. Um, Ted's no. not somebody you'd want to meet on the, I mean, well, he took advantage guy. of people and, uh, you know, he was a tough, he was a tough cookie. He was a bad guy. Yeah. He wasn't somebody to be admired. Uh, his bravery certainly was admirable. Uh, you know, this is a guy who volunteered and served in World War II when he was 15 years old. Uh, he joined the Airborne at 15 years old, spent the entire war. His entire time in Europe was spent while he was 16 years old. And he, in yeah, that time, he got two Purple Hearts and three Bronze Stars. Yeah, which is, which is incredible. That yeah. young, seeing that yeah. level of combat. And there. Then you f there you and, go. You there, Drew? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Is it better? It's still lagging? Yeah, we're good. Okay, cool. No, we're good. We're good. And, yeah, going back to uh, the World War II stuff is that that beautiful needle in a haystack nugget you found of that story of Braden going out to the German listening post when he was 16 years old. It's unbelievable for a guy like that to have found any account, written account from him in World War II. I don't know how you found that, but I it was incredible, you know, and, I, and that got added to the book. Uh, it was just amazing you found that story about how he would go out to the German listening post and wait for the uh, – the Germans to go by just for the adrenaline rush of it at 16 years old and how that got into an, a, an account for the group that he was in. He was part of the 101st Airborne. Uh, as you're showing there, I got that picture from his niece. Uh, he was in the uh, 501st Parachute Infantry Regiment, 2nd Battalion, uh, the famous Band of Brothers unit. I think that was the 506. Mm -hmm. uh, 506. Parachute yeah. Infantry. Yeah. Oh, 506. Okay. Yeah. Braid was a 50, 501 second battalion yep. E company, which was also the all E's were called easy company. Um, right. Just, yeah. Hard, hardened combat veteran at the age of 16. Like you said, two bronze stars, uh, just incredible story. You know, so that was my whole thing with Braden was, uh, you know, I didn't go out and find him. You know, I, I was a DB Cooper guy way before a Braden guy. And I still like to be just a general DB Cooper guy and not always attached to a suspect. But if I had yeah. to be, it would, it still would be Ted. And, you know, Ted was brought, I don't even really know the, the origins other than Bruce Smith and another guy on uh, DB Cooper forum named, yeah. that goes under the name Snowman. And I, I do not know Snowman's real name. Uh, I just know he spells Snowman a little differently, but it was him and Bruce yeah. Smith that developed, first started developing Braden. And what they did was is they reached out to some former Mac V SOGs. Of course, that's Black Op, Vietnam Special Forces. And they just thinking that the that, that cool Cooper heist looked like a, a, a Vietnam Black Op operation. They were asking the questions of former Mac V SOGs was, was there any guy among you that sounds like they would have done this type of a heist? And the answer was overwhelmingly always Ted Braden. There was never a number two. Like, well, it could have been Braden. It could have been uh jack right. smith it could have been david david daniels it was you never heard a second name ever among the special forces community specifically with the mac v sog it was always Braden, and you know that definitely piqued my curiosity i thought okay this needs to be taken a little further and then of course i knew any negatives that were already out there about Braden. i you know because i already knew the cooper case pretty well i'm like okay the guy's sure. five eight i know that he was five eight because we have his prison record from loretto uh when he joined the military at 15 he was he was five seven so he's definitely short you know that's one of his shortcomings as a cooper suspect but i knew all this going in and uh knowing that i would say okay here's the negatives that's something that you know drives me crazy about people that like richard floyd mccoy they never tell you anything negative about him oh it's always positive i like to start with the, yeah. with, the with the bad stuff and then get into the good stuff uh yes he's a little he's a little short we can talk about that and that's pretty much it yeah, that's it. You know, he's got hazel eyes. You know, or, you I mean, know, uh, for me, brown eyes. That's pretty yeah, much it. It's, it's a high thing, yeah, and that never deterred me too much because, uh, you know, I kind of agree. And I saw some of the uh, the messages you had back and forth with Flyjack talking about Cooper's height, and I know you. I think you think you know, like five ten is the sweet spot, and I probably agree with that. Uh, we, we're there. You know, we broke up again. Did I lose you, Drew? No, I'm here. Oh. There you are. Okay, we're back. Sorry, I'll have to yeah. edit that. But yeah, the height yeah. thing you said, I'm sorry, uh, the, my internet went act, acted funny. Yeah. You said the, the height was I what? Think, 
I think you were you're like you're comfortable like with Cooper like if everything that you know around five ten. You think would you say that's the sweet spot? Yeah, I I feel like five because I I do think that the that the women uh, the stewardesses all said he was about six feet tall, but we do know from psychology that people do exaggerate height when they're in, intimidated or uh, it's almost like it's pretty much set in stone that people will exaggerate height of a threat. Right. And so yeah, I, 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 I yeah, agree. That, that's known. And so for those who don't know, if you've ever wondered, if you've ever been in a gas station and you see uh, by the door, you'll see like a, almost like a ruler that shows like, like inches and in, in feet. What that is, is to help uh, gas station attendants judge height. People have a difficult time judging height because they will overestimate a, a threat. And that really goes back to some kind of caveman psychology where if somebody is threatening you, they must be bigger than you if they're taking advantage of you. Surely they must be bigger than you. So yeah, I do think there is point of a gun. Yeah. And, you know, we've got Bill Mitchell saying that he felt he could yank Cooper out of his seat. You know, now that could be the confidence of, of youth of a 21 year old who his girlfriend's talking to as he calls Tina, his girlfriend, his girlfriend's talking to Cooper the whole time. He's kind of mad about it. But so, I mean, you know, there is some discrepancy. It's a little small, but that's pretty much it. And, and Ted's eyes were hazel, but, you know, my eyes are hazel too. And the eye color thing, when, I, when we were at CooperCon, Jude Morrow, the author, made a good point. He came in one day at CooperCon and we were at the hotel bar and he said, hey guys, what color are my eyes? And everybody looked at him and said, brown? He goes, no, they're, they, were, they, were, they had green eyes, like legitimate green eyes. It was just the, the ambient the lighting. lighting affects that. Now, I don't think Cooper had bright blue eyes. That no, would, no. That's, yeah, that that would have, stand out. Yeah, oddly enough, but, when Braden joined the army, they listed his eye color as not gray, but silver. Oddly Strange. enough, they wrote silver on his uh, <laughs> never, draft card. I've never seen that. On his draft card, it says eye color, silver. Never seen silver colored I, eyes. I've never even heard of eyes. You know, a color is silver. No, that's so, like. That's really strange. Yeah, I don't know. But yeah, so his eye, his eye color and his height are really the only thing that are off from the demographic. But that's pretty much it. Um, and I have said for a while that the I one knock on him would be that surely this man was a suspect. It had to be. It just had to be. Like, there's no... I'll let you tell the story of Ted here in a second, but I just... But again, I asked Larry Carr, I said, did you ever see the name Braden before recently? He said, no, never. Now, again, one thing that's interesting is that Mac B. Sog was classified, and things that were classified at the time did not make it into 302s. The FBI would not put that in. So we've never seen the term Mac V. Sog show up. In fact, we've never even seen anybody in that. I've never, I've been through all 40,000 files so far. I've never seen anybody that would, I've never seen a fact pattern. All these names are redacted and things, but you can kind of put together the fact pattern from what isn't redacted. And I've never seen anything that even remotely sounds like Mac V. Sog. You know, they'll say he was special forces. You know, you'll see Green Beret come up sometimes but nothing that would indicate Mac V. Sog. So I, that was classified. So that would not have been in the FBI files at the time. So um, True. They, was, the, they signed 20 year NDAs. But what I'm learning now is, is something I didn't know as much back then was that it wasn't as kept, it wasn't as well guarded of a secret as you think. Actually, it even says in the Ramparts article, the famous Ramparts article, there's one of your heroes, John Lennon on the front, yeah. uh, where, 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 you know, Braden speaks about his time uh, leaving, you know, deserting Vietnam mm -hmm. and fighting in the Congo. Uh, it mentions Mac V. Sog in this magazine back from the 19, this is October 1967. And it says Mac V. Sog. It doesn't, well, really you know, which was but I really think classified I then. But see, I think it's my understanding that Ted doxed, you know, we have that word doxing now. I think Ted, I think that article doxed Mac V. Sog. That may have been the first oh, time it was ever that, written. That's what Ramp, Ramparts was, you know, an anti-Vietnam, right. uh, you know, anti, big time anti-war, anti-CIA uh, publication. That's why, you know, this is Braden, you know, giving the dirt on the CIA. Just yeah. Ruffling some feathers. He definitely ruffled feathers because we've got, the members of Congress called a congressional hearing, I think, 
after that. It's my understanding that they did because the Congress was like, wait a second, we're hearing about the CIA. There's a paramilitary wing for the CIA and they're in, you know, I mean, they, they should not be in Laos. We're going to start World War III. What's this about? So Ted was on the radar for some people for a while. But go ahead and um, a lot of people are new to Braden. So why don't you give a, a, a 10 cent lesson on Ted Braden? Definitely. Uh, so I, you know, I picked up Ted Braden from Snowman and, and Bruce Smith. When I wrote about him, I asked Bruce for his blessing and a lot of his research, which he very willingly gave to me. Bruce is a good friend, the mayor of Cooperville, uh, author of D.B. Cooper and the FBI. So that's how I found you know, Ted Braden. And then I just started researching him. And, you know, like you said, joined uh, World War II, 101st Airborne, 15, two Purple Hearts, heavy combat veteran at the age of 16. Uh, he's from Toledo, Ohio, Midwest. Remember Tina Mucklow? Possibly Midwest. <laughs> yeah, I was going to throw mm -hmm. that in there. Uh, from Toledo, moves back to Toledo, goes to uh, college in Toledo, University of Toledo for three years. He doesn't graduate. And he's has this in and out uh, time in the military. He's in the, back in the Army for a while. And then he's in the Air Force for like six months and he drops out. And then he becomes a, a parachute instructor. That's what he found out he was best at. It's jumping out of an airplane. He was just naturally adept at jumping out of an airplane he's probably the best parachutist that it was ever a member of the army mm -hmm. he uh gets on the army uh, uh sport jumping team called the golden arrows eventually that becomes called the golden knights but in the early 60s it was called the golden arrows and he's uh, doing jumping competitions all through europe he's winning a lot of these uh they through france scotland germany and uh, lots of sports skydiving where they you know land on targets and, and he's nailing all this stuff and then in 1965, he makes his way over to Vietnam as a member of MACV SOG, that's Black Ops Special Forces, uh, Military Assistance Command, Vietnam is what it stood for. And this, these are guys that went into, the, to, like you mentioned, Laos, which we weren't supposed to be in Laos because of the Geneva Convention. So they went into Laos. Uh, Braden was a team leader. Of, they call him the one zero is how, what you would call a team leader of a, a seven man team that would go into Laos and they'd be inserted by helicopter jumping out and, uh, it would be three, typically three Americans, the one zero team leader, which Braden was a team Colorado, uh, the one one, which was the, the radio guy. And the, well, the assistant team leader was the one one. And then the one two was a radio guy. And then the, the balance of the team would be uh, indigenous troops to the area, mostly what they call mountain yards, which is a French term for mountain people, which was an ethnic tribe that the U.S. Special Forces trained. So that balanced out the team. But Braden's team, Colorado. First team to do a wiretap in Laos, and they got a lot of valuable information. Crazy story. Uh, he's uh, doing uh, going after you know, prisoner snatches. They're they're doing sabotage of, of along the Ho Chi Minh Trail. That was the whole uh, point of Mac Sog. It was created by John Kennedy. This is what he wanted, and this was just to stop the unfettered use by the North Vietnamese Army of using the Ho Chi Minh Trail down into South Vietnam, wreaking all kind of havoc. So Mac Sog, their whole purpose was to stop that, to stop the. Uh, the use, the free, free flowing use of the Ho Chi Minh Trail by the North Vietnamese. So while Braden's over in Vietnam, lots of crazy things happen. He murdered a friendly South Vietnamese uh, soldier in, in a really sketchy thing, and it was basically just swept under the rug. Uh, all kinds of of insane stories where he's just has no fear of death at all. Is how he was described by Don Duncan and Ramparts and by some, some people that were in Vietnam with him. He at one point slept on the edge of a North Vietnamese bunker in Laos, like like at 5 a.m. in the morning. He was tired. He slept on an NVA bunker. I mean, he was not scared of anything. Like they think he was probably on the edge of, of just suicidal, but he had so, such a skill set for surviving and getting his team out that he always managed to, to escape death, basically. So that's why he becomes a good db cooper suspect later on because this this like you know everyone says about him like it, it almost it's like it's a negative it's so much of a badass that he could have done that jump blindfolded is or like you said eating taco bell on the way down it was just he could have done it blindfolded and then i go back to, you know cooper again is he was calm well braid was known to be calm in combat he was in in and in, in hair resing situations he was always calm he would never get rattled he had a temper for sure uh, mm -hmm. He could definitely lash out, but when it came into combat, he was very cool under fire was, was the way he's described. So um, kind of a, it's always a long story, but he winds up deserting Vietnam, which is actually crazy because he could, he was, he had already done 23 consecutive months of Vietnam. He was already a World War II hero. He could have ju probably just gotten out at, at the next few months or whatever until his term ended, but he just leaves Vietnam on his own. 
without telling mm -hmm. anyone. He just doesn't tell anybody, just deserts. Uh, comes back to the United States. Uh, this is the end of 1966, at the very end of December, where he deserts, and he's uh, in Miami. He winds up making his way over to Europe. He's in Belgium, and he's trying to find work as a mercenary because he heard over in Vietnam the mercenaries were making more money, and Braden was all about money. He, that's all he cared about was making a buck on the, on the uh, black market or as a mercenary, and he had all the skills, demolition, sabotage, everything. That's actually what Ramparts is, starts with a uh, job ad that he actually put out a real job ad in the San Francisco Chronicle advertising his services as a mercenary. So he winds up joining five commando down in Africa and he's not over there too long until he gets caught because the CIA found out about it, uh, arrested him, get him, they get him back over to America. He's held in the Fort Dick stockade where he meets Hank Birch, a guy I know really well, he's still alive. And uh, he was, Hank was the guy that overseeing Braden in captivity at Fort Dix, and he just Braden, he never forgot about Ted Braden because Braden was in a cell. He had a TV in his cell, which is unheard of. He was in mm -hmm. his military and had a television. This is true. <clears throat> had cigars with filters on them, and filters are a huge uh, no no there because the, the inmates would stop up the toilets with the, with the filters. Braden had filter tip cigars, he had reading materials, everything you ever wanted. And he looked at Hank one day and he said, Oh, don't worry, sir, this will all work out. So, mm -hmm. long story. Or Braden gets a uh, a discharge under honorable conditions is what it was called if he promised to never join the military again. And this is, uh, I think it's around March of 1967 where this happens. And he has to sign something to get this. I mean, he's a deserter getting a, a discharge under honorable conditions. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah, and it was uh, a man named Harold K. Johnson was the, uh, you know, the head of the entire military at that time. Only person higher up was the president. So Harold K. Johnson calls down to Fort Dix and said, you know, we're not, they were supposed to have a court martial for Braden. And he said, no, we're not. And they're like, why? He goes, well, there's not enough MPs on the base to secure the courtroom. And even Hank said, man, this is Fort Dix. It's crawling with MPs and said, nope, we're not having a court martial. We're letting this guy go under, on our honorable discharge. And, and Hank couldn't believe it. And mm -hmm. you would line up by rank when they released Braden and you would line up by your rank. And, and Braden was a Sergeant first class. And he was ahead of a former, former Lieutenant Colonel. And they put Braden at the top of the line. So it was clear to Hank he was getting preferential treatment from somewhere very high up. Uh, so that's that's Braden's story in the nutshell. And everything else is, uh, you know, what people believed of him at the time and why they felt he was D.B. Cooper. And that's one thing that Braden has that a lot of suspects don't. People that knew him personally believed he was D.B. Cooper. Yeah. I talked, to five, I talked to five people personally that believed he was D.B. Cooper. And out of that five, only two knew each other. And that was Al Keller and Leonard Tilly from Vietnam. And they both firmly believed that Braden was D.B. Cooper. And then the others, uh, his uh, one of his stepdaughters, uh, Al Tire, which was his jumping partner in the Golden Arrows, was convinced that Ted Braden was D.B. Cooper based on a partial confession uh, that Braden gave him at a, a truck stop in Bowling Green, Kentucky in 1973. Braden was a truck driver. Uh, which gave him means to roll around. I mean, he's one of mm -hmm. these million, a million men back in uh, 1971 that wasn't home for Thanksgiving Eve or probably Thanksgiving because Braden was just always on the road. So uh, that's where all the circumstantial pieces for Braden come together, uh, his background, uh, and basically what they thought of him, what the the, the Matt B. Sog said and what people like uh, Al Tire said is, is, is basically what I put everything together for Braden about. Yeah. And, you know, one of the things about Ted that I used to joke about with Ted is like, if Ted was not D.B. Cooper, then there would have been a copycat hijacking that is currently unsolved also. It's like, because he would not, because it's like, if, if he wasn't Cooper, this is a guy who would have been like, I could do that. And I'm going to do that. He would, he would have been a copycat. Oh, that was absolutely. one argument I had is that, you know, it's like, you know, the thing about Ted Braden, as I've always said about Ted, is that if you gave somebody all the facts of the Cooper case, if you gave 100 people the facts of the Cooper case and just had them dig through it and get well versed and you said, I want you to invent D.B. Cooper, they would invent someone, 75% of people would invent someone like Ted. That's my belief is that they would invent Ted Braden. Because, and one thing that's interesting about Ted, another thing that's in his favor is, as far as I know, he's the only Cooper suspect who we would, 
I would say it is more probable than not that he knew about 727s being used that way. True. That's We don't know that for sure, but it more more probable than not to a right. high likelihood. I, I did ask, you know, as you know, I asked Al Keller that, a recording of him, and Leonard Tilly that, uh, who knew Ted in Vietnam. And they said, absolutely. Leonard Tilly said, I knew you could do it. I mean, with confidence. Leonard Tilly uh, said, mm-hmm. you know, I'm one of the few that probably, you know, that could have done that jump as well, which comes up in this discussion about Matt V. Sog. I think a lady on your Facebook group said, well, I know Braden's this badass as Sog, but I'm surely many, you know, Mac Sogs could have pulled off the Cooper jump. And that's true. Mm-hmm. So that really begs the question, why only Ted's name comes up with talking about them? I mean, it's so prominent when the subject of D.B. Cooper comes up among former special forces yeah. that know anything about Cooper, that they, they are so steadfast in their belief that they don't even mention anybody else, you know, and not right. just the legends like Billy Waugh. Uh, it's all of them that, that care to, to to comment on it. So it's that actually could go in reverse. Like, yeah, other socks probably could have done it. They're trained to jump at night under this, you know, uh, really tough conditions. I'm sure. The Leonard Tilly said I could have done it, but he did say yes. I knew you could jump uh, that plane, and and uh, he knows that Braden probably knew it as well. Yeah, and Braden is really, yeah, of, of the Mac V Sogs, You know, these are generally, you know. Very, uh, these are hardcore military guys, and, and the majority of them are not master criminals. And Ted was, you know, Ted. We have evidence where he was also he he was he was investigated by, I believe, the FBI for other crimes, including crimes that involved hundreds of thousands of dollars of theft yeah, in the seventies. Stole so, fish and meat. Stole fish and meat. Drove it across state lines. He would arrange for his loads to be stolen in his eighteen wheeler. He would whatever yeah. he was carrying that day. He would say, "Hey, Frank, come pick. You know, come come find my truck over at the truck stop on Route Nine. And then Braden would call it in. Hey, they stole my cab. I mean, they they were they were onto that. Right. Yet this is a guy who was investigated many times for many thefts and only ended up spending uh, a couple years in prison at some point in the eighties. And you are you and I have put extreme effort into finding out why. And yeah. the, I cannot find any record of why he was in there. Yeah, like you show that record. Like I, I love it when you compare what you found on Braden versus Walter Recca, who's supposed to be this KGB CIA. And you know, right. you and I enjoy picking on Recca, but but uh, well, it's, it's like this is what it should look like when they don't want you want them to. Yeah, I've got that here. Actually, I'll pull that up. And then you see Walter Recca with all this information. You know, like yeah, you know, I'll, I'll I'll pull that up right? now. I'll pull that up now for people. So basically, uh, I have a service that I use for my legal profession where I'm able to look up people's backgrounds and things pretty well. And when you look up, this is, this goes into Ted Braden being CIA for one thing is that Ted, we have phony CIA agents, you know, Rackstraw claimed to be affiliated with the CIA. Recca, of course, claimed to be affiliated with CIA and with KGB and with Mossad and with MI6 and in Starfleet Academy, who knows what else he said he was with, you know, Recco was a liar pretty much about everything. But in one way that you can verify that to what a CIA agent looks like in real life is I, I pull up Walter Recca. So this is what Walter Recca public records look like. You can see there, he, you can see his, this is just briefly, this is only a snippet of the page. This page is huge. You've got telephone numbers, date of birth, partial social security numbers. You know, his thing's got all kinds of things, driver's licenses, if you switch over to Sheridan Peterson, for example, you can see there apartment number, phone numbers, 22 addresses listed that he's lived at. 22 addresses Sheridan Peterson lived at that we have records for. Five phone numbers for him. We have bank account records. Now let's switch over to Ted. If you look up Ted Braden on this same service, that's it. It's just nothing. It, it, this man ba- barely existed. That is... a. It's wild, really, when you look at that. There's just nothing. It's it's almost chilling. It's like this man is just there. Doesn't exist. There's his. There's no uh, social security death index on him. No, it's like he's. It's like he never died. Yeah, right. <laughs> he's just there, and so it's really, it's fascinating when you look at it that way. That this man just doesn't exist. So he's really neat, and so with um. But with Ted is that we have this 
guy who who knew it could be done, who was a, a legitimate criminal at the time. His trucking company was headquartered in Vancouver, Washington, I believe, Consolidated Freightways, if that's Actually, correct. Portland, it was, I, I think it was in Portland at, at that year, and then it went, and then they moved across the river. Okay, to Vancouver, and, and there was a giant, giant truck stop that was north of Van, that was north of Vancouver. Jubit's, still there. Jubit yeah. trucks up. Yeah, yeah, it's huge, and it. it I mean, yeah. you look up, you, you look up like in Google Karen, Earth. Thanks to Karen, if you're watching, for uh, turning me on to Jubits. Oh, was that Karen that did that? Yeah, yeah. I'm, Karen, I'm, I'm Professor that, Karen? Uh, yes, yes. Professor Karen, great. Yeah, she's great. Yeah, yeah. yeah so smart, smart lady. Oh, she's great. Karen, I hope Karen sees this. Yeah, she's wonderful. And the, yeah, so it, he could have easily parked his truck there and just hiked or got taxi cab to there. Everything, like, and again, this is a guy who had a family at the time, but wasn't around, really. He had a wife and stepkids, I think, but he wasn't, yeah. he was not dear old dad. No, by any stretch, he was no, gone. Was not well liked, you know. The, the shocking thing is his step. One of the only reasons his stepdaughter even talked to me because, you know, for her, Dale Cooper's it wasn't. It's just, if you're not into it, you're not into it. She's kind of like, eh, kind of thing. The thing that got her attention was I told her that. Did you know that Ted Brayton had two biological children? And she was stunned. I mean, this was her stepfather for years and years. She had no idea he had two biological children, so he could keep a secret. Uh, Al Tire was his best friend for years. Al Tire, Braid was married three times. Uh, he would, uh, when Al knew him, he was with uh, Patricia, his wife, Patricia Blizzard Braden, uh, when he was in Germany and very close with Al. He would go over there for Christmas and stuff. And uh, Al had no clue that he had two biological children. Wow. I mean, that's really impressive that, that, yeah, like you said, he can keep a secret. And that's something interesting about Ted. I just laugh about, like, for, just to reiterate, for those who didn't understand, this man essentially murdered somebody in Vietnam, was given house arrest, or briefly while they were sorting out what to do with him, escapes house arrest, goes to the Congo, and becomes a mercenary in the Congo, and is fighting there with some random people. The CIA, the CIA come and get him, bring him back. He's facing a court-martial. He could have been shot, executed. This is He deserted in wartime, during, for during one war. thing. Desertion during, during wartime. Yes, during wartime as a sergeant of a team and not only do they not kill him they give him nice accommodations and then the the joint chief of staff for the yes. army I can always forget that yes harold k johnson harold k johnson this is yeah. the highest ranking officer in the american army himself called through ted braid's courts martial and said let him go it's just yes. astonishing like this is un unheard of so this man knew where all the dead bodies were essentially uh you know and sure enough he did blow up back Sog in ramparts he was not a guy to be crossed and it is what's fascinating about him is that you have to know that this man was arrested many times we've we see many arrests for ted's in the, in the records but what we don't see for ted is the disposition of those arrests we don't see what happens they just nothing ever comes of them they just vanish and it seems to me, and it does it sounds like Hollywood, but I, I have to think there's some legitimacy to it, is that one thing we haven't mentioned is that uh, Ted Braden, if Ted Braden had several friends, not many, but it, but one of his, Al Tyre you mentioned, but one of his other friends was Jack Singlob, who was the founder of the CIA. Yes, so, the founder of the CIA. Yeah, if you could invent friends to have in high places, <laughs> the head of the CIA is one of those ones you'd want. And... So it's almost like when Ted gets arrested, we see, I can envision a scenario where he's sitting in a jail cell and he hears footsteps and here comes somebody, perhaps Singlob himself, smoking a cigarette saying, all right, Ted, we got a job for you to do. And Ted goes, okay, you know, and so that's how Ted gets out of trouble as he goes and does some assassination or something. And normally that would sound like BS, but we know that Ted really was CIA. And again, look at that thing i just pulled up we know this guy was black you know he he was off the grid and still is to, to a large degree so this was real and there were uh reports of ted being seen in the 80s and was it honduras yeah, yeah. Or panama yeah el salvador yeah stuff like yeah that. Oh, yeah and, and it's yeah, really I'll... these weird references like oh he looks like a guy i saw and you know yeah and why would they 
Right, and, and those are things that would be weird to make up. You know, yeah, so really, there has really to, there's probably some legitimacy to it. And with Ted, you know, uh, somebody asked earlier how many jumps he had. Uh, I believe it was 960 on his 960 yeah. something on his record. Right, yeah, the one that where he had to add for uh, you know, in ramparts, yeah, it was nine hundred sixty-two, and I can't remember how many free balls, but a lot of them. And of course, right. he, was a, he was a halo pioneer, high altitude, yes. low opening jumping. He loved being in Vietnam because there was no restrictions, especially when you were in SOG. You didn't really have sure. the kind of oversight regular army did. So he loved pulling the ripcord under a thousand feet, which was insane. Right, uh, and he loved adrenaline. He was an adrenaline junkie and uh, loved pulling that cord. It, as, as late as it's humanly possible. Yeah, right. I mean, reserve shoots would not have worked for him. He'd have just died. If he had if his main shoot didn't open, he would have died. And one of the fascinating things about Ted, like when I said you try to invent a DB Cooper, Ted Braden specifically himself was sent to teach South Vietnamese paratroopers how to land in trees. So that one of the things he taught people how to do was to land in jungles and trees. So jumping over the Pacific Northwest, literally, again, when you're a guy who would jump or pair or get off of a helicopter in North Vietnam in a three-man team, that is so terrifying sounding. And so for this guy to jump into Clark County, Washington on a Wednesday at 8 p.m., is not that frightening to him. This would have been a Tuesday or another Wednesday to Ted. Like you said, Taco Bell, eating on the way down. And it explains, also explains too, when we talk about the parachutes, Ted was not a skydiver per se. He was a military parachutist. And military parachutists aren't the type who will own, they don't own their own gear. So for, we look at guys like Rob Hetty and McCoy, who were copycats who did have their own gear, those two guys were skydivers. Skydivers are very attached to their gear, but Ted's a guy who jumped with whatever was given to him. And this guy had a death wish anyway, so he probably didn't care. But oh, yeah, all of is. Ted's, yeah. yeah, but if you consider all of Ted's jumps, 900 something, you know, and how many were off the record, we don't know. But of all those jumps, it's unlikely he ever packed those parachutes himself. Other people did. The army had oh, rigors yeah, probably to did do not. that. Yeah, and he would. I think he would have looked. You know, asked Al Tire, would he look for a packing card? You know, going by uh, Tussauds book that Cooper looked for a packing card. He goes, oh, right. absolutely. You know, he might have known <laughs> some of the local jumpers in the area, and that's one of the most distinguishing things about DB Cooper that I always knew early on, just from knowing it. And I knew the case pretty well back in the day. But it'd be great with this, uh, people like you that have really come in and found out all this new stuff that we didn't know before. But one of the overriding things that most, even casual. Uh, D.B. Cooper people knew was that, that he was described as being middle-aged. Uh, well, of course, Braid was four, 43 at the time of the, the Cooper hijacking, and that was rare even in Vietnam for special forces. I mean, the average age of the soldier fighting guy in Vietnam was 19, of course. I think there was a song mm -hmm. said 19, you know, talking about Vietnam. And then special forces was really just two years beyond that, about 21, 22, because they had some more training. Well, Braden's mm -hmm. over there in his mid to late, you know, mid like 37, 38 years old. So he's already an old man uh, yeah. in terms of being in Vietnam. So, you know, it's not like they just threw out a guy's name that was too young, like Rackstraw or whatever. And, you know, no, it was a guy that does hit that that yep. benchmark everybody knows for Cooper. You were looking for somebody middle age, and he was. And you were, if you were going to go to drop zones for sports skydivers back in the early 70s, you didn't see guys in their 40s. I mean, it's, mm -mm. it's unheard of, you know, uh, these guys were all young. You see pictures of them, you know, because there was a, a relatively new sport, even in the early 70s, uh, to sure. skydive. And you didn't see dudes over the over 40 there. So that's one of the things, you know, no matter who people think Cooper is, is one of the first things you look for is how old were they at the time of the hijacking. And he fills that box. And I think he's a pretty good match to the sketches. I'm not, I don't think he's the best, but he's pretty good. It's not like Walter Recker. We're like, yeah, okay. <laughs> you know? Right. Uh, yeah. He's no, he's bad. good enough. Yeah. You know, including the guy that you were, you, you did a video on the guy wearing the hat. What was his name? McDonald. I can't uh, remember. Donald Murphy. Yeah. I think I've Donald got Murphy that here. Post. Yeah. Show that. I mean, that's a pretty, and I didn't do that. Somebody sent that to me. Um, right. Which I like, cause it shows at least I'm, I'm, you know, not completely biased, but I, you know, of course I am, but uh, somebody else. No, that's good. So that's pretty darn good. No. Uh, so 
you know, he has that going for him. There's things that, that do show up with Braid that you would expect if he is Cooper. A smoker as well, obviously. Oh, absolutely. heavy smoker. Yeah. Yeah, we, we definitely know that for sure. Uh, John Smoker. Yeah, John uh, Packer John uh asked uh did Ted have any history of having or using benz- benzedrine? Yes, yes, absolutely hundred percent. Um I asked Al Keller about that, who was uh Al Keller was uh the third guy in line of team Colorado for a while. He was, uh, I think, assistant team lead for Braden in Vietnam when JD Bath uh, had an R and R back to the United States. And Al Keller said, "Absolutely, Braden offered me ben- a Benzedrine in Vietnam." Uh, Jim Hetrick, who was uh, Ted Braden's assistant team leader for most of his time in Vietnam, said that he o- they always had it in their what they call their getaway bag. They carried Benzedrine. Yes, and Ted had actually offered that to Al Keller. Yeah, and, and for those who don't know the connection there, Tina, well, apparently uh, well, uh, Bill Ratajkowski gave an art, gave us a, uh, a talk, or not a talk, but Bill Ratajkowski gave an interview about a, the co-pilot of the Cooper plane, gave an interview about a week after the hijacking where he said that the hijacker had Benzedrine, which for those who don't know, Benzedrine, the best way to think of Benzedrine is just like Adderall. It was Adderall all the time, and so it was prescribed for weight loss, for attention deficit disorder, but abused by truck drivers, party kids, college kids studying. So the same uses that Adderall would have to, to, you know, in today's world, you would have that. But soldiers did carry them as well. So we do know that, that that is a detail that is pretty interesting about that Ted, you know, he checks all these different boxes and it's he, he really... He checks the most boxes of any suspect that I know of. You know, he's got a few things that aren't aren't what you know what you would want. But again, those are rare. It, it's not many. It, it, and that's pretty much it. You know, wouldn't you agree with that? Yeah, you know, he is, and and you know, yeah, I'm kind of biased because you know I come in sure. I took it from Bruce and Snowman. Snowman's still a big, a big Braden fan. Bruce is kind of, a, you know, Bruce. No, nah, I don't think it's Braden. He's a little short. He was five four. Well, he was five eight. Uh, and I love, I love that picture. There's a good story behind that picture. That came from Ted Braden's nephew, uh, who was in Scotland, lives in Scotland, moved to Scotland a uh, long, long time ago, and uh, I found him. And that was a big genealogical breakthrough because I did not know T- Ted Braden's mother's maiden name, which was Deerbaugh. It was mm-hmm. just a really lucky genealogy genealogy break because he uh, she divorced Ted's father about a year after he was born. Uh, that's another part of Ted's story. He was you know raised in part by his stepfather who did not like him. He was more partial to his own son, which was Braden's half brother. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ted Braden went by the name Corky when he was young. That's why I named my little screaming goat Corky that I use <laughs> on my my podcast after Braden because his name's Corky. But uh, but that, that picture was in a shoebox literally in, in Scotland, and it had never been seen before. And he sent it to me. Well, the first thing that struck me was he looked swarthy there. Uh, if you, you know, the yeah. whole picture will show him with his mother, who's very fair skinned, Mary Dearbaugh. Mm-hmm. But Ted is really dark there. And that's not photoshopped or anything like that, because the no. whole picture shows his mother, who's whiter than I am. Uh, and he was, he, he did have a dark complexion, at least in this photo, which is around 1975. Uh, some of the earlier yeah. ones, he looks a little wider, buddy. So, so even then, you know, so you can see where I, I keep finding things that don't really point away from him. Uh, yeah, the, towards him. Yeah, this you is know, the oldest. This is the life. oldest. This is the oldest picture we have of Ted. There's no photographs of this guy. I, I mean, is that right, Drew? I don't have any pictures of him as an yeah, older that, guy. That, that, that this is, is it. That's, that's the last one that I that I've ever seen. Yeah. So there's just not a lot of photos of this guy at all, and it's especially when he is, you know out of the military and in, in his civilian life. So he wasn't photographed often, probably by design of his own design. He probably wasn't somebody that liked to be photographed. And what's fascinating, what I love about him is that even when he's, he's just an asshole. Like even when he's, oh, yeah. I think he's in his seventies, gets a DUI and refuses to tell them his name. Yeah. And if you just do that, they're just going to hold you until you do. They can yeah, actually do that. Trouble. But he, yeah, Darren, Darren yeah. Schaefer loves that story. I decided to. Uh, <laughs> he refused to give his name when he gave me. Yeah, and I, I feel like he even had like, oh yeah, and he had no driver's license. Like, not even like when you say, I don't have a license on me. The man didn't have a driver's license, so he was driving without a license because he didn't have one. 
He was, we know he was arrested at some point in the 80s for driving with swapped car tags. I think he was driving a stolen vehicle with swapped car tags. I said, what are you doing, dude? You're like 60 years old. But that's Ted. And, it, you know, it just, I just think about the things that we, what we want with Cooper. We want a swarthy guy. We want a guy with a, a death wish, really, in a way. Cooper was, was I, you know, I don't want to say that Cooper was calm. I, I think he, everybody's nervous to some degree, but they're able to, your capacity to hide your fear matters. And soldiers can certainly hide their fear. Uh, there's no doubt Ted was afraid of things. He was a human being. Yeah, he but, would get agitated. There's no doubt. Uh, when he threw yeah. a, a, a Vietnamese uh, commander to the ground one day because they said, oh, he's going to lead the team today. And he's like, no, he didn't. And Braden literally picked this guy up, threw him to the ground, and he right. guy cried. You know, that, that story was crazy. So, yeah, yeah he it, absolutely could get agitated. Well, and other things, too. Um, I'm not sure if you mentioned that Ted did train as a pilot in the Air Force. Yes. So that's another check mark. Is this is a guy who would know what IFR clearances were, as we've talked about lately. You know, Cooper seemed to know piloting things. So that's kind of a hill that I've kind of grown that I've grown to die on. Essentially, is that Cooper had pilot training to some degree to know to banter back and forth with with these pilots. So Ted was an Air Force trained pilot briefly, which is interesting. So he he was really he's an all around you know. Again, he's just a criminal who knows airplanes and can do the jump blindfolded, isn't afraid of what parachutes he's going to get, doesn't care. He would know where McCord was, obviously. Oh, know, yeah. I his, think a lot of people uh, flew out of McCord to go over to Vietnam. They did, uh, right. Think, yeah. right. So, yeah, he so wouldn't know McCord. Uh, uh, you know, he has all that. But uh, like I told you, it's my favorite thing about Braden is things that come out of Mac Sog. Uh, and I, I know you know this well, but some people that are new to Braden might not. And this is a, a true story. Uh, a lady, you know, I was researching Braden. And there was a lady, ironically, named Bonnie Cooper. Uh, I think her husband was ex-Special Forces, but she was somebody that would put together Special Forces reunions and very well known in the uh, general Special Forces community, uh, putting things together, being very active on social media, X, Y, Z. And I ran into her and she kind of found out a little bit about Braden and that. And she goes, well, you need to contact this guy that I know that's a top special forces researcher named Steve Sherman. Uh, Steve Sherman is uh, still does a uh, own special forces books.com website. And he was head of psychological operations for fifth special forces in Vietnam. So this guy had been around, you know, he knows a lot of things. And uh, I think I emailed him and I said, Hey, have you heard of this guy, Ted Braden, blah, blah, blah. And uh, he winds up calling me on the phone and he goes, I want to know more, you know, like really gung ho. And uh, he said, tell me about this guy. And I said, well, here's the background. I go, people like Billy Waugh, legend. And he, you know, I, he, I think he may have known Billy. And I said, and John Plaster, believe he's D.B. Cooper. They've stated that before, you know. And he said, oh, well, I know John Plaster personally. He goes, I'm going to call him right now and ask him about this guy. And this was about three years ago or so uh, during COVID. You know, I think at the beginning of COVID, I can't remember how long ago. Uh, so Steve Sherman calls John Plaster because he knows him from a union. He's known him for years personally. Calls him on his cell phone and says, hey, uh, this guy's telling me about this guy named Ted Braden. And he thinks you think, you know, that says you think he's D.B. Cooper, blah, blah, blah. And this is what Steve told me that Plaster told him on that phone call. He said, Steve, I know something about Ted Braden that I cannot tell you over a phone. This is a true story and I will go to my grave with it. Uh, and I'm like, whoa, what is it? Is it that, he, is that he's Cooper? Is it that he, that was he on the grassy knoll? I, you know, even if it's not Cooper related, I want to know because I'm a Braden guy too. Uh, if it's nothing Cooper, whatever, I just got to know what this is. And this is a true story. He said, I cannot say over a cell phone line what it is. And he said, I will tell you when I see you in person where I can tell you my lips to your ear. Uh, and I'll tell you what it is. So this is during COVID. I'm not even sure where Plaster lives, but Steve Sherman lives in Houston, not too far away from me. And uh, so two or three years go by and I'm kind of keeping up with Steve Sherman a little bit. And I finally just emailed him and I said something like, hey, Steve, did you ever hear from from John? You know, talking about John Plaster and my phone rings, my cell phone. And I'm like, yes. And I see that Steve Sherman, because I programmed him in and he said, hey, Drew. And he goes, Steve. I said, yeah. He goes, remember that thing? Uh, the whole D.B. Cooper thing or whatever. He goes, I asked and he wouldn't say his name. So he's keeping that plausible deniability. And he said, I talked to somebody and yeah, he's D.B. Cooper. Yeah. I said, wait a minute. I thought like in my mind, I thought he said, he, wait, you said he's not D.B. Cooper. He said, no, he was D.B. Cooper. 
I go, did Plaster tell you that? He said, Mac V. Sog. That's all I'm going to tell you. Bye. Click. True story. That's wild. <laughs> it's about as about as crazy as it gets, really. Jeez. Yeah. yeah he, I mean, that's that's that's, that's creepy. And I mean, it happened. I mean, and then you talk about guys like Billy Waugh. Billy Waugh, who I have his book here, Hunting the Jackal, where he hunted uh, Carlos the Jackal. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, biggest badass ever, the godfather of special forces, they call him, uh, was a big believer that Ted Braden was Stevie Cooper. He told me that on the phone. Bruce Smith had interviewed him years before, and Bruce just said, hey, uh, you know, Billy's really uh, approachable. I've got his cell phone number. You want to call him? I'm like, well, you got Billy Wall's cell phone number? Because I'm a big fan of this guy outside of all things Stevie Cooper. And I called Billy, and Billy passed away about a year ago. Uh, he made it to like, 93 and mm. I think when I call Billy, he probably lived for like another 10 months, 10, 11 months, but he's still really sharp once he, once he got going again. And he goes, yeah, I, you know, he goes, I, I do believe Ted Berlin with Stevie Cooper, but you know, he, he stopped short of a full endorsement. And I said, uh, you know, John Plaster thinks he's Stevie Cooper. And he said, he knows what he's talking about. So that's as, that's as far mm -hmm. as I could get, but that's a pretty good endorsement from a guy who's got 50 years, black ops, special forces and black ops CIA took the first surveillance photos of Osama bin Laden. He was got within 20 yards of Osama bin Laden taking pictures. He could have killed him easily, but they wouldn't mm. let him. He said, I could have, I could have booby trapped his car. He goes, I could have thrown a rock and killed him. He told me that on the phone. Uh, that's a pretty good endorsement. Uh, but like Mark Messer likes to remind me that still doesn't put him on the plane. Yeah. Uh, gotta have... not. If we could put somebody on the plane, we're not. Yeah. They'd, they'd be you Cooper. Know? You know? Yeah. I mean, if we could put Pe Rekka Pekka on the plane, I'd still have to he, well, say, okay, it's got to be him. Yeah, well, I guess that's the one. Well, that you know. Yeah. Now he's you know Ted, Ted's a uh, that's fascinating. Yeah. Now special forces they, you know, I've spoken to a, a Mac Vsog guy myself who said that Ted was before his time in Mac Vsog, but they all believed that Braden was Cooper and. That was good enough for him to think that Braden was Cooper. He overheard these people talking about it, and you know that's kind of yeah. how that is. You know, is that that's, that was just like it was. He was part of the culture. You know that he was Cooper, and they all seemed to understand this. So, and really, with Ted's, this is a guy who apparently uh, remember if you are facing literally a firing squad offense, and the highest ranking officer in the military calls to let you off the hook you've got some powerful medicine as the uh, indians native americans would say you got some powerful medicine on your side for sure and ted certainly and on his side no doubt about it you know um he wants to uh packer packer is asking about uh tell the story about tell the story about ted's relationship how nice he was to women or to women he didn't know apparently he may have been, he may have been mean to the women he did know but how he was with women he didn't know tell that story yeah, yeah it mostly comes from uh, al tire who is ted's jumping partner in the golden arrows al was a highly accomplished skydiver in the military too won the scottish championships uh that was in there and it was a jumping partner with ted for many many uh skydiving competitions and he recalled a story of, at the parachute club for the uh, the Golden Arrows in Germany. I think it was in Wiesbaden, some, uh, somewhere around there in Germany. And when uh, if a woman walked in a, a woman walked in a room one time when he was drinking with with Al Tire, and Al Tire did not stand up when the woman walked in a room. Of course, Braden did, and he blasted Al Tire. Said, "Don't you ever do that again." When a woman walks in a room, you stand up. And Al Tire said after that day, he always stood up when any woman walked in a room, even if he was in a crowded place, he'd do it because of that scolding he got from Braden. Uh, so right. that's how Braden felt about women. He was very, um, very polite with women in that way. They had that, had that respect there. Yeah. And just for a guy who was so dangerous, he could be nice to people too. And, but again, something was off with Ted. I mean, clearly he had some, mental condition that made him fearless and able to commit crimes without remorse. Um, you know, he, yeah. I, he's not, a, not, not going to say he was a sociopath, but this is, this was a guy, this, this was a guy who was capable of killing people Border, and not yeah. thinking about it. People. Yeah. Get, you yeah. Know, he told, uh, 
uh, Jim Hetrick one time in Vietnam, and I think it was uh, J.D. Bath who was on his his team, that he had a girlfriend in Vietnam, and she was married. And uh, they told uh, Jim Hetrick, who's a really straight-laced guy, very conservative, even you know a guy that was in black ops, very well-respected, said, hey, I want you to kill this lady's husband for me, you know, because I don't want her to know I did it. I mean, just very serious. This wasn't a joke. And right. I said, I go, why would he want, want that? He go, he go, and Jim said, well, maybe he wanted to own a beach house. You know, but he was dead serious. You know, you'll kill, yeah. can you kill this guy for me? No big deal. Yeah, yeah that's how just, he was. And I think he was mentally ill, especially towards the end of that tour. Uh, he had been combating way too long. One yeah. Of his, his boss, basically, as they called him, Scotty Creer, uh, was going to was gonna testify for him when he was being held at Fort Dix, but they never called on him because, of course, Braden got out. But he was going to say that, you know, he thought he was one of the greatest soldiers he had ever encountered in his life. And that he felt that it was part of the army's fault what happened to Braden because they mm. left him in combat for way too long. Right. Yeah. I think I always mentioned that he reminds me of like Sergeant Barnes, if you've seen Platoon. You know, just a guy who's, you know, the only thing that can kill Braden is Braden. <laughs> it's like, yes. you know, but he's been been there too long and, and kind of lost his mind a little bit. Uh, Eric Ulis is in the chat, and Eric wants to know what we think about the tie evidence. As far as uh, Ted, so what do you have on that, Drew? You know, I, I was thinking about the tie earlier. You know, I was thinking about the tie earlier, and of course that's changed a lot. Uh, you know, there's developing things, and that was a popular deal. And now we think that the antimony could be calcium, but I know those guys are working on it, which is great. I agree with with you know, with, you know guys like Marty. Uh, that's the best piece of evidence we have. That's where we're going to go with it. Uh, you know, going back early with the tie, there's you know pure titanium on the tie. It looked like it was made with a hunter process, and it's just one of those, just a, just probably a w odd coincidence that Ted's name pings off of an address in in Niles, Ohio, where RMI Titanium was, who made titanium with the hunter process. Uh, it was an address that it's uh, connected to a place called Santisi Trucking. Of course, Braden was a truck driver, but I you know I think about the tie too. I mean, I never made a hard play for Braden on the tie, but you can make one because his father was a tool and die maker. And Braden's backup job, basically not being in the military, was a tool and die maker, a guy working with metals in a metal shop. His uncle was a tool and die maker. His uh, niece told me that Ted knew how to do that. He was you know, by his uncle, more more so by his uncle than his father. His father passed away, I think, in 61 or 62. Uh, so he like I know one of the one of the uh, elements on the tie was a spiral chip, which looks like it came off of a lath or somebody grinding that metal. Uh, of course, we'll never know, but you know, it, it, the tie definitely looked like it belonged to a smoker. And we know Ted was a heavy smoker. He was yeah. going to smoke Vincent and Hedges. I'd love to say it was Raleigh, but you know, I true to, well, true to and I know Vincent and Hedges. We've but. seen, well, we've seen evidence before that truck drivers did wear ties on occasion, that that is oh, something yeah. that I Those believe really consolidated guys did for sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and you might be able to make a play for Richard McCoy in the tie. You know, I mean, he, he you know, I, I don't think McCoy was Cooper, but he worked at Electrolux making vacuum cleaners uh, in between his two tours in Vietnam. Uh, you know, who knows what metals they were using. And I, you know, I wanted to add, I think Eric knows, or and you should know, but I, I, maybe I'm not remembering it right, but did the tie come from North Carolina? I know it's a JC Penny um, Towncraft, but it, I can't recall. Maybe I'm No, the state, wrong. no, that it, it's not state specific. The tie is just yes. JC Penny tie. They don't know when yes. it, but it was first manufactured in 64. But, you know, if, 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 if a truck driver is hauling concentrate, then the, you can get dust on your tie that has the particles. And I mean, there is a, there is an argument to be made about that, you know? So, and about now explaining Tina Barr, um, again, I, good luck explaining Tina Barr with any suspect, unless you're just making things up, like the rack straw people making this up where they attacked Dwayne and Dwayne right. Ingram and that kind of crap, you know? So really, you know, I mean, again, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe uh, Cooper lost the money, or maybe Ted Braden lost the money somehow, or maybe, yeah, you know, I mean, this plot, I mean he's not perfect, be. but I, I remember one of your theories being that an accomplice or somebody may have buried it, or or, or something like well, that was one of your, yeah, one of my odd out the wall theories is that he gave it to, you know, Cooper had shown to be generous on the plane. He was offering money to Tina, to Flo, to Alice. He was shown to be generous already. So one of my weird Tina Barr theories is that perhaps he got a ride from somebody and 
which is what McCoy did. McCoy got a ride from Pete Zimmerman. Zimmerman, Zimmerman, yeah. Yeah, and so maybe Cooper got a ride and just tossed this bundle to the guy as he left as he left the car or left it in the car as a like, thank you. And once this person drives off and goes, what the hell is this? And once they realize what the hell it is, they just throw it out the window somewhere, you know, and who knows. But that's just yeah. one theory. Again, Tina Barr, you start getting into Tina Barr. Okay, so Eric says that the tie was manufactured by a company in North Carolina. So okay, that's where I heard it. Okay, I wasn't losing my mind. So yeah, you weren't, no. Yeah, I knew yeah, I had it. So uh, yeah, was, was, my point was to, that even McCoy could make somewhat of a play because, you know, who knows what methods right. were used by Electrolux, but, you know, a lot yeah. of people didn't know that. McCoy, we worked for Electrolux in between tours in Vietnam. McCoy always interested me, by the way. Uh, you know, and I know what a Darren knew McCoy. Like, you know, I know Darren yeah. Lee that, uh, that McCoy was Cooper, but he always felt that uh, Cooper might have known McCoy, which is interesting. But it, going back it, to Tina Bar, um, you know, I never had a hard theory on it, but I, I am kind of conspiracy a little bit like Bruce. Of course, Brighton's a conspiracy guy, but I think the money pr could have been planted to be found. Uh, I know Tom's done some great research on that, but one thing, and, I, and I've never put pieces together hard. But Braden did know a local in Vancouver that had a private plane. Uh, his name mm. was Richard Earl Jenkins. He was in Mac V. Sog, original 33 at Contum. Braden did know him. I don't know how friendly they were, but they I know they knew each other. Uh, Jenkins was a contractor who who avidly flew a private plane in and around Vancouver at the time of the, of the hijacking. So it's just something I keep in the back of my mind. But, you know, I know Al Keller kind of shot that down. He goes, no, I knew Teddy. He'd never have an accomplice. You know, it's all him. Uh, but sure. it's just something I note that he did know a private pilot in Vancouver at the time. Uh, but you know, it's it's big big problem if you got caught. If you know, if uh, and speak if to speak to Ted's uh, wealth. You know that the stepdaughter told you about his wealth that was unexplained yeah, his, wealth. Yeah, his his stepdaughter was not a big fan of him, of course, because he had a very rocky relationship with his wife, uh, Pauline. And uh, she had three older sisters, and, and I think she, you know, she was the youngest. Uh, her name's Camille. And she said when, uh, in the early 70s, as far as she could remember, she's I think she must be 58 or so right now. So she was young at the time. Don't get me wrong, but she had memories. And that they lived in a penthouse in Chicago at the t in 71. And uh, they bo both her mother, Pauline, and Ted drove newer model Mercedes-Benz cars. And she always wondered how they could afford a penthouse in Chicago and two newer models, Mercedes. Ted, Ted Braid was a big fan of Mercedes Benz. Mm -hmm. uh, even in the 60s, he had one in Germany. <laughs> I think he actually may have maybe had shipped one home from Germany for a while, but they mm -hmm. always he always had a flashy car. He always dressed very flashy. Uh, you know, some people say, Why would Ted wear a cheap, cheap tie? <laughs> Who knows? But he did wear ties for sure. Uh, you know, like what they would say about him, if you didn't know better, when you saw Ted, you know, when he wasn't in active duty, you'd think he was a, a, a college professor or, yeah. uh, or or a colonel, or it was how they described him. He thought it was either a colonel or a college professor is how he, how he typically would dress. But, uh, you know, Tita Bar is, you know, I guess anybody's guess. Yeah, but Ted, yeah, Ted uh, was very, he's an interesting character, just was very professorial at times. He would... He would, I believe, didn't they see him sometimes smoking a pipe in Vietnam? Yes. I think there's a, yeah. Yes. And, 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 and he would wear sweaters. He yeah, he'd wear sweaters and, and things. And, and he's an one, interesting. One thing is, is interesting about Braden that I really uh, tried to try to uh, hone in with Al Tire on was his, the way he would speak. And Al Tire said that when you would ask him something that if, if he either didn't like it or he wanted to contemplate it, he wouldn't immediately speak back. He would you would always think that you said something wrong because he'd be silent for a while. Like, Hey, Ted, what do you think about this guy that we're going to be competing against in this jump competition? Just for example. And he would just pause for a while. I think he's this and that, like it's just weird. You know, he was, mm -hmm. he would like kind of a only kind of a guy that would only speak when spoken to type very. And he would always think about what he said and it had to be correct. I mean, pretty much grammatically, but he, he wanted everything he said, he wanted to sound, in, you know, that he was, thought of as intelligent and he was intelligent we know that from his gt score i think it was 150 yeah was, was, i think that's general trainability yeah, very I think, high I've heard it called general technical but i think it's really general trainability and to extrapolate iq out from that it's pretty high yeah for sure yeah i just pulled up the image here of my i call it the i jokingly call it the burns sketch but the, the burns sketch the one that i made which is a kind of a conglomeration of all the sketches uh, Ted's Ted's got the features that you want, you know. He's got the 
high, higher cheekbones, kind of the thin face. You know, Ted, Ted, Ted really works. The hairline's good too. You know, his hairline does look rather, uh, you know, kind of Greek, you know, not Marcel, but you can just tell he's, he's got something going on with his hair there. In yeah, that photograph, like he, there he can look a little fuller in times, and then and then in some he looks yes. Very bald. It's one of Vietnam where he looks very bald, and then yeah, this one another here one that he has more hair. Like yeah, that one. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So like, how how is this in like the mid sixties? And it is with we that hair, that. and then this is mid seventies, and he's got more hair. It's like hey, I need whatever point. Ted. I, <laughs> <laughs> I need whatever Ted Braden used. I don't know what he was doing, but it, it's maybe part of the uh you know the 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 tactics of a, of a mac v sog i mean i you know I, like billy Waugh, i told billy i said well you know billy uh one of the big i know you're a big believer in Braden is cooper but you know a lot of people say he's too short and billy Waugh laughed literally laughed out loud at that and said something along the lines of you have no idea what we could do meaning mac v sog mm -hmm. black op like he could make you think whatever just his pure verbato could make you think that like he thought nothing sure. of that you know, and then, and then going right. back to Billy, you wonder. I mean, Billy Waugh, he's he, he was in he's twenty yards from Osama bin Laden, and <laughs> he's been more far more time with the CIA than he did in in Vietnam and actually back to Sog. You know, you wonder what he really does know. You know, mm -hmm. does he just think this or does he know this? Uh, that's you know my quest. You know, and he, and, he, and you couldn't even crack him, and now he's gone, unfortunately. Uh, but you know, he was pretty steadfast in his belief. Right. Yeah. So let's see. Uh, that's that's Lisa talking to Nikki Brighton on there. But yeah, they. I just like Ted because he is a scary individual who could also be calm. I my my favorite Ted reminds me a lot. If you if people have ever seen the movie In the Line of Fire, Ted reminds me a lot of the assassin in that movie who's played by John Malkovich, who is a Vietnam Special Forces turned into a CIA guy. I mean, essentially, you could, you could, you could say he was Mac V. Sog in the, in the movie because he has a CIA Vietnam operative who gets, comes back and gets delusioned and decides to kill the president. Great movie with Clint Eastwood in it. And it, he's very calm at times. Throughout most of the movie, Malkovich's CIA character is just as calm as can be. But every now and then just explodes into a rampage against somebody. That's and him. And that's Ted. Just it would explode on somebody. Explode. And, yeah, big time. Right. And if you look at Tina, I have often felt that Tina was being very, at times, she did not want to throw Cooper under the bus because she's, because she's a nice girl. And I do think that Cooper lost his cool on a couple occasions. If you read between the lines... If you listen to what Radicek says in a couple of his things that where he spoke uh, to the Northwest Orient or Northwest Airlines Museum in 2013, Radicek said that he could hear Cooper through the phone screaming about the knapsack that was that the famous knapsack. He was she said he says that he was threatening to kill everyone. He was going to blow. He was going to set the bomb off if you know because he was so mad about the knapsack. Which does beg the question why Cooper explodes about the knapsack, but then this doesn't go, go get me a knapsack. He, he just go, he just, if you put it. Yeah, MacGyver's, instead of he's just screaming a rampage, I want my knapsack. And then goes, well, okay, I'll just make my own thing. Instead of just, you know, so why would he care so much? But he seemed to get really angry about that. And then he was really mad about the refueling taking too long. Yeah. Um, if you listen, if you read Tussaw, which again, I have no reason to doubt Tussaw at all. Um, he had extended time interviewing Tina Mucklow. She describes Cooper as pounding his fist into his hand and basically like punching the, the, the fuselage. He was. I don't know if I've ever he, heard that. He was so angry about the fuel situation that he was punching into his hand saying, damn it. He was cussing saying they're, they're trying to you know stall me. You know, this isn't working. Uh, so he was a little miffed about that. So, you know, with Ted having this up and down type of personality, oh, I could yeah, see him hot and cold, uh, like uh, Litter Tilly said about Braden. Litter Tilly, uh, you know, he said, he goes, I would bet my life, my home, and my distinguished service cross that Ted Braden was D.B. Cooper. That's a pretty big wow. statement. And he got a DSC. It should have been a Medal of Honor, but one guy in the unit that got killed that day, they wanted him to get it. They could only give one because sure. his family would need it because he was killed. 
Uh, but he did not like Ted Braden. He said when he went into a bar, went to one of the bars at the club, uh, you know, for the, the, the guys, uh, he would switch his drink to his left hand so he could put his right hand on his pistol. He said, that's how uneasy he made me feel just being in his presence. Wow. Yeah. Do we know what hand Braden was? You know, uh, he's right-handed if you look at him when he's smoking and some of the pictures right. in Vietnam. But I think there's a couple things that look kind of left. And I know there's some uh, belief that Cooper may have been left-handed. But I, according to his niece, there was a lot of people that could use either hand in her family. Uh, a lot of uh, ampedestrians would run through the family where a lot of people could e you know, easily use either hand, according mm -hmm. to her. So uh, it, took, it looked basically like he would hold a Swedish K with his right. So mm -hmm. I'd say dominant right-handed. Right. Were you talking about the, I'm trying to think of the Mac V. Sog guy who got the Medal of Honor. Oh, I forget his name. I wish I could remember his name. Uh, maybe, maybe, maybe Lauren Hagen was his name. I'm, I forget. But yeah, those guys were tough. They were tough as nails. So uh, Packer Jack says uh, you have to promote Drew's book. Yeah, Paratrooper of Fortune Thanks, Packer. is Drew's book for sure. Uh, that's my favorite book of Drew's, of course. But, uh, you know, was, Drew, Drew is also, Drew has crossover, as those who don't know, he is a Zodiac uh, aficionado as well. And I would say probably the leading expert, the leading expert on the Yuba County Five. I don't know of anybody else who's... Second, second. Uh, guy oh, there Tony is a... Wright. Yeah, Tony Wright's probably number one, and we collaborate a lot. Uh, okay, Tony, so... Yeah, he's, got, he's got a new book out uh, called Things Aren't Right About Yuba County Five, which is fantastic. So, yeah, he, he is, uh, he's the Ryan Burns of Yuba County Five. Uh, <laughs> right. and, well, thank and you. I'm, and, I'm, and I'm happy to have him there, so it's great. And, and man, you've been a huge help for Braden. And, you know, talking about everything, it's like, whoever, it sounds corny, but that D.B. Cooper is the friends you make along the way. It's yeah. so true. I mean, I think that's more important than who D.B. Cooper is, is, you know, being yeah. friends with you, Nikki, Darren. Uh, you, yeah, you it's a community. It's a community. Like, if, you know, like like Dave. Dave has his own suspect, William J. Smith. I met Dave in person. He's just a mm -hmm. fantastic guy. Uh, you know, I totally respect him. And, you know, it's just the well, thing we have in common is we all like Cooper. You know, so yeah. even if you don't like the suspect or you like the other guy, that's fine, you know, because we all at least like the case and like the lure of the case. So I, I, yeah, I we're all like, just, I like the unknown DB Cooper too. I'm a fan of that guy. Yeah, we're all just nerds. And as far as I'll mention that, I, as far as Braden and the FBI go, I have, I have, fo Braden, I, I have FOIA for Ted Braden's, for any, you basically, when you FOIA something, you have to be very specific about it. So, for example, I don't, I have sent, things saying, hey, I would like for to get Ted Braden's file, things like this. And they will write you back and say, well, we can't confirm nor deny that a person is listed in the FBI files. What you have to have is their actual suspect number. And I, I've said before, I don't think that Ted, even if he was investigated, would have a subject file just because of the nature of his, his background, essentially that if they, or they would leave, the, Larry did say they may have had a file on him, but they would have left that out, the Mac V. Sog stuff, just because they don't they don't put that in there. So it wouldn't, even, it wouldn't even be redacted. It just wouldn't be in there to begin with, right? Yeah. So, you know, you could make that, the argument could go, like, like you said, surely they would have looked at this guy, you know? Yeah. Absolutely they would have. Uh, but he doesn't he have show to. up. He's nowhere. No. Like, you know, there was one record of a master parachutist, but we finally figured out that wasn't Ted. Uh, yeah. you know, nobody at list is, is it was Mac V. Sog, of course, but you know, you think there would be something in there about I'm, him? Did they show it his picture to the stews at least to you know, hey, this is guy, you know, because we know they look, they definitely looked at guys around 5'8. I always go back to a, a guy with the last name Ayers. I can't remember his first name because I call him Bradley Ayers. Bradley, Bradley Ayers. Yeah, you know it all. I love that. You're the encyclopedia. <laughs> uh, yeah, Bradley Ayers, who was a pilot, right, from um, Minnesota. Yeah. Where, yeah. the, where the flight originated, but they, they took him so serious that they did get his photos in front of the stews. And of course they rolled him out all off Richard Floyd McCoy and said it wasn't the guy, but he was five, eight. This is a, I'll go ahead and tell this story. I was going to save it for the book, but I'll tell the story for anybody who's listening. So I recently found out, this is not Ted Braden specific, but this is Cooper who the first suspect was. Okay. And it, it was really, uh, it's really fascinating 
who the first the first suspect is a guy named Joseph Johnston. Now check out this fact pattern. I, I've, I've I've joked with Larry Carr about this, and he goes, "Man, no wonder they were all over this guy, all over his ass." So in the very first, so two days on, on the morning of the twenty sixth of November, so uh, the day after the day after the day after, two days after the hijacking, there was an urgent message that was received by by the Seattle office of the FBI, and they say or they, re they receive it in Seattle from Arkansas. It's an agent in Arkansas saying, hey, somebody came up to me or some informant contacted me and said there was, there was a guy living in West Memphis, Arkansas who was uh, an armed robbery. He had armed robberies. He was a real villain, this sort. This guy had been training in West Memphis, Arkansas to skydive. Now, this guy's older. This guy's 48 years old. Now, how many people get into skydive when they're 48, right? So they said, and he had been, this guy had been fixated on hijackings. He was a armed robber. He had done assaults. He had, he had done rape. He was a bad dude. And he was a career criminal. So, and that the FBI goes, okay, we'll look into this. This guy sounds really intriguing, right? This guy's has been training as a skydiver. He's an armed robber. Talking about hijackings. Sounds, sounds about right. Older, middle-aged. So they go to the post office, the FBI, local, the local FBI there, they go to the post office in West Memphis because where do you get people's addresses from? The post office. They go to the post office in West Memphis and they say, "Where?" They say, "Will you tell us this guy's address?" Now this is this is great. The post office goes, "Oh, this guy. Uh, he's 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 been having his mail his mail forwarded to Portland since September. So two months before the hijacking, this guy in West Memphis, Arkansas, who's trained to be a skydiver, suddenly has his mail forwarded to Portland to an address." that is two miles away from PDX. And and so surely the FBI is like, done. We got him. That's it. I mean, the, my God, how, how on the nose is that, right? Well, they investigate the guy, and it turns out that he was arrested for DUI in Longview at around 2.30 on the day of the hijacking. So this guy's arrested for a DUI at 2.30 in the, in the afternoon in Longview, which is with basically within the DZ. This is just outside Woodland. And so what is this guy doing? So if it's not, so it almost makes you wonder, was this guy Cooper's accomplice? Or because he's not Cooper because he's, he's, he's sitting in a jail cell during the hijacking, so it's not Cooper. And they did show his photograph to the Stews before they realized that he was sitting in jail at the time. And this guy, check this out. So this guy was a pilot, a unlicensed pilot. He had been flying aircraft since 1946. Numerous times this guy is arrested for flying without a license or flying recklessly, endangering people. Okay, And he's also an armed robber, spends time, time in the pen for fraud, armed robbery, assault. Just a real creepy kind of guy. And he is... he's. Doing armor, he's doing time. This guy had arrests in Arkansas, Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, Ohio, Minnesota, of all places, uh, Oregon, and Washington arrests. Okay, and he's actually serving time in the late in 1970 for armed robbery in Ohio. He's paroled in our, he's paroled in January of 1971 in Ohio, then goes. Uh, he's st the FBI files say he's staying in a halfway house, or he's staying in Salvation Army homes. There's your uh, there's your goodwill thing with the tie people joke about. <laughs> is he's staying in Salvation Army homes in in the early seventies, right. right? And then he suddenly decides to move. He gets permission from his parole officer in March of seventy one to move to West Memphis, Arkansas, of all places, where he takes up skydiving as a hobby. This guy just got out of prison for armed robbery at 48 years old, takes up skydiving at this parachute club in West Memphis. Then suddenly, then he skips his parole, doesn't get permission from his parole officer, just goes to Portland all of a sudden. So he is there at the time. He dies in Portland in March of 72. So he didn't live much longer past the hijacking. Dies, I don't know what he died from, but he died at 48 years old in Portland, this skydiving armed robber. So that is... Yeah, like if it weren't for the fact he was in jail, he's, you know, at the Oh yeah. He's, at the he's top. Yeah, and so this is the top suspect. So I just find that really fascinating that you have all these characters and it's almost like I have I'm of you you what's great about 
the Cooper case is that this guy can be anything you want him to be. True. There is an, he could be an advanced skydiver like Braden, or he could be a complete novice. Yeah, the the the, the, the wuffo, the wuffo yeah. as Brook calls it. Yeah, and so he can be there. There are so many facts in the Cooper case where he could go one way or the other. Did he know what he was doing, or did he not? I don't know. Or was he timid, or was he not? I don't know. Badass you know, or because geek. a badass or a geek, or you know, he could be anything, and so he could be. Spec Ops Ted Braden, master criminal, or he could be this shitty convict guy who spent his life arm robbing, who was also a pilot, and then takes up skydiving, you know, which that is more similar to what I would expect Cooper to be, just this schlub who was a c criminal sort, you know, which is what, I mean, again, how many people wake up and decide to go commit a capital offense? Cooper was somebody who was prepared to die that day, you know, I've talked yeah. to McNally. So the other analog is, you know, of Cooper is we've got McNally. One of the great things is we've got Martin, Martin McNally to talk to now, who is an active participant in the Vortex. There you can see the picture behind me. Yeah. I have a framed picture of me and Mac there at CooperCon. And Mac's still around. Yeah. Mac, yeah, Mac said he had no fear. If you talk to Mac, he says he does not know what being scared is. He thinks, he says, I must be missing that part of my brain. He says, I don't think I've ever been afraid of anything in my life. And I believe him. Like, he, yeah. I mean, this is a guy who had no fear of jumping, who had never put on a parachute in his life, yet wasn't afraid to jump out of a jet going 330 miles an hour. You know, it, he had no fear. He wasn't afraid of it. So Ted had a, Ted had a lot of that no fear, too, it seems like. No he just, fear at all. And, you know, the people came, Kluber could have been suicidal, but why well, ask for the notes back? You know, yeah, no, no, Cooper. I think he knew he could die, but wasn't really planning on it. No, it wasn't planning. It wasn't a suicide. He wasn't committing suicide. But if he died, then oh well. I don't think he cared one way or the other. Because, and again, I talk about Ted's lifestyle. This guy was driving a truck. This guy had spent, again, this is a guy who won three bronze stars, was wounded twice in World War II, 16 years old, would crawl out. To the German positions, <laughs> okay, by and then, himself. right, by himself, a 16-year-old. How scary would that be? Yeah, Terrifying. No fear. No fear. Yeah, right. Kill, kill him on sight. And just right, absolutely. Just And then we've got him volunteering. He was bored being a parachutist, bored with the golden arrows, and decides, hey, I want some action. He's in his late 30s, mid-30s, and says, I want, I want action goes and volunteers and becomes part of Project Delta, which becomes Delta Force, just because he's bored. Because he's bored. And, you know, that's why I like, and this is just something I, you know, I guess call it a preconceived notion that, you know, there were letters in the D.B. Cooper case. Uh, most of them are considered to be forgeries, of course. But I always felt that D.B. Cooper would, would was, of course, Dan Cooper, and he would never just latch onto the moniker of D.B. Cooper. And there's only one letter that wasn't signed D.B. Cooper. And that's, I think they call it letter number six. And it, it says something like, I had to do something with the skills that uncle taught me. You know, that sounds yeah. like some of it had been in the military. And that letter is eerily similar to how Braden writes in Ramparts. He calls uncle right. and, you know, and, and shortening Uncle Sam to Uncle and Sam. And clearly letter number six is from somebody that's at least, if it's a fake, he's alluding to the fact that he was in the military and he had to do something with the skills that is Uncle taught him, meaning the military, his skills jumping out of an airplane because the military taught me how to do it. That voice in that letter is so eerily like Ted Braden, the insults in it, lackey cops, uh, D.B. Cooper is yeah. not my real name. Uh, that's always what I expected him to do because it was Dan Cooper, not D.B. So why, you know, of course, the fakes are just going to say D.B. Cooper. You know, and right. I the real Cooper, or, you know, if he wrote a letter, would never at least say Dan Cooper. But well, and there's even a rich man. Well, look, and, and there's even a connection to Dan Cooper if you look into Braden, uh, with Braden serving in the with Braden going and serving in the Congo as a mercenary. The Congo Belgian, was a French Belgian. colony, Belgian. So, uh, uh, no, not French, a Belgian colony, right? The Congo, right, I think, was Belgian. Belgian. Belgian yes, and he yeah. Had been so in Belgian a, during, with the Golden Arrows, and then he was in Belgium, of course, when he signed up for Five Commando. Right. So, so the, a stranger to Belgium in Brussels. Right. And so this is a guy who could have easily had access to Dan Cooper comics. Wouldn't probably wouldn't be able to read them, but he could look at them and know that they're about skydivers. And hey, 
Ted loves this. Yeah, what's interesting about Ted is we talk about halo jumping that is so common now. You see in all the movies, the, you know, the Navy SEALs do halo jumping, which is high altitude, low opening uh, jumping. And Ted was essentially a, a test jumper. You think about test pilots like Chuck, like, you think about like Chuck Yeager, these test pilots. Well, he was a test jumper, essentially, uh, for the Army. So this is a guy who is so good at parachuting. You know, we have him jumping. We have him training people to jump into the woods. How you hit a dart. So, you know, I, I, I've often called Ted the god of circumstantial evidence. And if he was a bit taller, that's the only hang up for me, is if Ted was if Ted was 5'11", I, it would be hard to convince me that he wasn't D.B. Cooper. I would have to see something in the files that said that he was photo was shown to the stewardesses and then they eliminated him. I would have yeah. to have, see something like that to it, make, it because help. he's, it would, yeah, he's perfect. Yeah. Other, I mean, otherwise I think too much, but you know, because he's got so many good things, but it's right. hard to judge height on an airplane. I'm sure. Uh, you know, we know Tina was five, eight sat by Tina, but you know, if I sat by my daughter, who's actually a little taller than me, you know, I'm short, I'm five, seven, but, uh, you know, she's 13 and, and, and a little bit taller than me. But if she's sitting next to me, I look quite a bit taller than her because it's all in her legs. But yeah. it's, I think that's kind of hard. And I think women, you know, I think women do uh, judge height a little taller than men would. You know, Bill Mitchell, 5'9", 5'10", uh, you know, Braden, 5'8". You know, if he if he had good posture, he's going to hit Bill Mitchell's bottom side. And, you know, I always put it, I think even the FBI put a lot of stock in what Bill Mitchell said because he's looking at Cooper in a jealous way. He did not know the plane was being hijacked. That's why I, you know, honestly, I'm such a believer in Bill Mitchell that if there was no form of a turkey neck at all on Braden, I'd, pr mm. I'd probably even rule him out myself. But he did have but, one. Yeah, absolutely. And what's funny is that when you talk to Bill, Bill, I remember knew Bill as a student of the Cooper case, which is great. I love that Bill has kind of become a, he has embraced his footnote in history, essentially, as I say. Bill's a great guy. And uh, Bill, actually discussed Minchie mentioned Braden by name uh, uh uh two years ago at Cooper or Cooper on 2022 we were having a discussion about it and he was just saying how that you know his view of Cooper was that he was a dork a you would think a Milton Vordal nerd geek kind of Vincent Peterson sort of that kind of engineer that was the vibe that he got from from uh Cooper and he told the FBI, the FBI, one of the questions they asked him was essentially, could you take this guy in a fight? Like they were just trying to figure out, trying to get from him how big this gentleman was, or you know, and he goes, Oh yeah, I could, you know, he was, you know, I could take him in a he fight. Was a football you know, player. yeah, he was, yeah, he was a football player. He was a tough guy, you know. Bill's Bill's a big guy too. Bill's about six two. He says, Oh yeah, I could take him. And Bill was joking, saying, I've often thought over the years, what if I had actually tried to like fight DB Cooper? He goes, you know, maybe I could have beat up. You know, he he, he had forgotten Vordal's name. He was like, maybe I could have beat up that guy. He goes, but I thought about like, what if it had been someone like Braden guy? He would have killed me like on the spot. I would have been killed. <laughs> I'd have been dead. You know, if I had tried that against him, and that's true. I, I, you know, Braden probably would have <laughs> snapped his neck. Probably, you know, I I, I do think that, that Ted. Now, Drew, I've always one. I've never asked you this. Well, what is your what, would Braden have had a real a real bomb? I, I I don't think he would, but it would have been something very authentic looking. You know, just being, yeah. you know, being a, an expert at, at demolition. He was a demolition expert. Uh, you know, he could do all that kind of stuff. So uh, it would have been very realistic looking. I mean, he well, he's not going to do anything half ass anyway. Uh, you know, yeah, I, yeah, and I, and I I totally yeah I think it would have been very very realistic. But I love how you picked up on the point going back to the MacGyvering of, of, of uh, cannibalizing the parachute shroud lines to secure the money back that, you know, I, I want to ask Jim Hetrick that like, do you remember Braden doing anything like that? Cause whoever Cooper is, that is such a huge insight into who he is. Somebody that would be like, it's like the movie 10 cup where he just right. keeps shooting that bad shot because he, he wants to get it right, but blows the U S open. You know, it's the same thing. It's like, that is such a window into the guy. I, I don't know if I can say Braden was like that or not, but I love that window. Well, Cooper. Yeah. 
Well, and also, you know, if you read, you know, we believe that if you look at Tusa, and I, there's no reason to doubt this, that this is that this photo, this drawing on I have up here is how Cooper, that Cooper had a drag bag, essentially, that Cooper's bag wasn't tied, the money bag was not tied to Cooper's body. It was on a tether, which is what one thing that paratroopers will do is they'll have a, a bag, that, a, a drag bag, essentially, that, that, that hangs beneath them. That way that it takes the extra weight off of them, for one thing. And it, it serves, self, serves several purposes. It's going to hit the ground before they do. So they're going to hit the ground with less weight on them. So it, and even when you're you know, 20 or 30 pounds makes a difference when you're hitting the ground at night. So And also, it would tell them at night, if they couldn't see the ground approaching, they would know where the ground was because the bag would hit first, and they could prepare themselves for that that landing called a PLF, a parachute landing fall. So, so Ted's definitely somebody who could have used the drag bag. Yeah, that's an interesting thing that you that you brought out was that because you when you read about it in the early years, you know, we all thought he just, just started you know tying the rope around his body to secure mm -hmm. the uh, the canvas spank bag, but but that's no that's a great thing that you brought out. Yeah, and Cooper. Uh, the, going back to the bomb, if the bomb, I don't know whether it's real or fake. I don't really have a strong opinion either way, except it didn't need to be real. But it, but, but it, I would say this though, that if it wasn't real, it was a very convincing fake because the way it was described would have worked. You know, um, the way that, so Tina, Tina Muckler's father was an, elect, was an electrician. Mm -hmm. So Tina was able to, she had a pretty good mind for, for all of that, for describing how, how, how the wiring and things. They actually asked her how to do that, and I, maybe I can find that here. That they asked her how did how you know how did the bomb, how the bomb look right? You know, and she was able to describe the bomb and the way that she described it. Georgia, who is a professor on the uh, drop zone message board that he was able to, uh, I believe he got some Marines or somebody, some demolition people to actually make a bomb that was using Tina's description for, uh, of the bomb, essentially, right? Oh. And that bomb would have gone off. It would have, uh, actually, I think I've got it right here. Let me, let me get these up here. Let me pull them up right here for everybody who's watching. I believe I've got her description here. Wait, that's not the one. It'd be this one. Yeah, so here's here's Tina. You can see this actual, uh, this is the actual radio transcript. You know, the flight op says, have the, have the stewardess describe to you the briefcase contents. And then it, it, it shows, uh, see it says 305 stew. So this is the voice of Tina Mucklow. Tina's saying, it's a, this is kind of like Twitter in a way, but Tina's saying that it's in the, it's in the left corner of the briefcase there were eight sticks of dynamite. That KXXX thing is a typo. That's how they would fix typos. But so ignore that. But it says had had eight sticks of dynamite, about six inches long and one inch in diameter, two rows of them, then a wire out of there, then a battery light, a flashlight battery, about as thick as my arm and eight inches long. Then also we have her talking to a f a flight ops a different time. And this is her description. She goes, you can see here, where she says the red sticks are about the color of my uniform. So Tina was wearing the red wow. uniform. So and she says they look like big fire. Great. Yeah. Yeah. It says she, she says they look like big firecrackers. And it's interesting that she says it's in the left corner of the briefcase. So uh, she, she she's remembering it pretty well. But yeah, the detail is uh, amazing. Yeah, she even says, look, the wire attached to the dynamite with red insulation. So she even knows that. The, you know that 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 specific one is red. That specific you know uh, uh, wire is red, and somewhere else I, I wish I could have it, but it says that the she says somewhere else that the the tip of the red wire had been stripped, like you strip a wire so you can get to the wire underneath the rubber. So she even picked up on that detail. So Tina knew detail really well. So the I, way that, that she just she, she didn't get that kind of detail for Cooper. No, well, and that's something else we have to remember about Tina, is that Tina did not want to look at Cooper. She tells us that that she that's avoided great antagonizing point. him. Great right. Point. So this is why Tina is able to tell in detail what type of suit he was wearing. 
She says he's wearing a brown suit, not black, but a brown suit with a thin black stripe. Because if you picture Tina having to sit next to this guy and she's not going to turn and look at him, you know, and just antagonize him, what is she doing for three hours? She's like looking down probably. Just like looking at anything except for him. Yeah. So she's looking down. She's the only one that noticed his shoes. She's the only one that noticed his shoes. Right. Uh, And then she gave a description. Pebble pebble green. Right. Yeah. She gave this great description of, you know, of his shoes, you know, and we have this. um, I actually have this. uh, Where is it here? I'll add this for the group here that what the way that she described his suit was that this had this thin brown stripe. When people say that Cooper was wearing black, what they're actually describing is they're describing his overcoat. His overcoat was indeed black. And that's what most people are saying. Most people didn't get close enough to him to see under his, uh, his, uh, uh, under his raincoat. And so what Cooper actually looked like is this, uh, he had this, he had this brown suit here, right here. Let me pull this up, how I've, I've, I've illustrated this. If it'll pop up here. Yeah, so you can see there that that's really how Cooper would have really looked, is that he had this black overcoat with this brown suit underneath, with this thin black stripe. So that's really how Cooper's going to look. So Tina's got good detail. So Tina, but Tina tells the FBI, look, I didn't, la- I never looked at the guy, really. Oh, I didn't I look at him head on. on. Yeah, I didn't ever see him head on. Yeah, she said, I saw his profile, so I wasn't, that's about it. Where that's why the FBI go back to Florence Schaffner a lot, because Flo interacted with Cooper about eight different times before, uh, before he became the hijacker. So she had all these interactions. Yeah, she had all these interactions with, you know, with him. So, but yeah, the, well, okay, so Alan says about the road flares, these being six road flares, no. They're not road flares, and we can tell you why, because road flares are about 15 inches long. They have to be long because you'll burn your hand if you turn them on, right? If they're, imagine you have a Roman candle or something that's only six inches long. That'd be dangerous. <laughs> right. It's not cut in half because it'd spill out yeah. and, you know. Yeah, so, ignite it. Yeah, the dynamite is, is six to eight inches long, and that's exactly what Tina describes. It's about six to eight inches long, whereas road flares are twice that length. So we don't think these are road flares. Um, whatever these were, were convincing enough to be real. And I know from the, from other hijackers of the era, most of them put no effort at all into their into their uh, into their bombs, into their fake bombs. They would put they'd have a shoebox and just say there's a bomb in there, and that's really all they needed. Nobody was going to say, "Show me that bomb," because it, I mean, again, what the calculus of Am I going to call this guy's bluff when he has a when he might when he, I mean never, there could be a one percent right there could be a before. there could be a one percent possibility that it's fake I, I mean a one percent possibility that's real I'm not calling that bluff it could blow the plane up right so yeah, I mean, it it was a it was a very convincing fake if it was a fake very right yeah that detail she gave is is incredible so I mean so going back to Tina she is only seeing him she's looking at things like his shoes a profile and all that. We remember the documentary when she's looking at a table full of, of photos of Robert Rackstraw. She rules them out with some authority. And yeah. Rackstraw's definitely young, but I, maybe that's just an age thing because she just said, wait, I think so. Rackstraw looked his age. So maybe that's why she had that confidence, but I'd love to know. And just to off the record, I won't get into the detail. Tina Bucklow knows who dead Braden is and showed some interest in him. Yeah. So I'll, leave, I'll leave it at that. That's true. Yeah, I'll, that's I'll true. Yeah. On it. She knows who he is and she has shown some interest in him. Uh, but that being said, I don't know if Tina can remember, how, you know, what he looked oh, like. Oh, no, I know she can't. But she, she might remember some things he did or said or acted or that, that she's hold, you know, holding on to. Maybe if the movie ever comes out, I don't know. Uh, but I think that's one of our best hopes, Braden or not, but it was what she can remember because, you know, I, I, with the tie and the DNA, it's just it's great that everybody's doing all these strides for it. But, uh, you know, it just – we want to know, you know what I mean? Like what, what could she remember something that she held back? Yeah, this is, here's a document here uh, that I'll read this. It says that she, this is an FBI document. She pointed out that during her contact with the unsub, which is an unidentified subject, he, for the most part was seated on her side so that she only saw his profile. 
She never observed him from straight ahead, and most of the time he was whispering in her ear, and therefore she was not in a good position to observe his facial features in great detail. So that's Tina Mucklow's own words to the FBI, saying, hey, look, I really didn't, you know, just look at this guy because I didn't really want to, right? It, it's not, you know, she didn't want to, she didn't want to antagonize the guy. Yeah. Right? Like, don't look and, at me or this is kind of, yeah, like. Yeah, well, and, and that's what they say. If you're being, if you're, if somebody is is robbing you, like a bank robber, then don't, and don't look at them, right? Because you're going to, yeah. you know, it, it's best to just, you know, Make do contact. that. Yeah. yeah, and here's an and here's another document, people. This is Tina Mucklow. Yeah, so this is the this is the bottom part of that. It says she admitted that because of this time lapse, she is getting somewhat foggy in recalling his exact appearance, and she thinks she may have looked at the artist's conception as the sketch so often that she feels influenced by this. So this is a document in August of '72 where we already have Tina Mucklow admitting that she is getting somewhat foggy in recalling his exact appearance. So that's less than a year afterwards, right? Yeah, so any, fading. yeah. So the hopes where people were like, "Oh, well, let's you know maybe let's show, show her a photograph or something." No way. Yeah, same with Bill Mitchell, who who freely admits that he cannot remember. You know. No, Bill famously will say Bill's Bill's joke is, "Do you remember the face of a substitute teacher you had in fifth grade one time?" No, like there's just no way you can do that, and that's always what Bill, you know, has said that is is that he can't. You know, Bill's like, I, I have no memory. What Bill remembers, he still remembers the turkey neck. He, he says, I still remember yeah, that's, something. That's why, yeah, it's such a great, that's a, and they wrote it down the day of the hijacking. They wrote, their FBI wrote sagging chin, and Bill remembered that Cooper spilled a drink. So you can take that to the bank. That's from a, a, a jealous college student the day of the hijacking that he remembered the turkey neck and, and he, that Cooper spilled a drink. Yeah, here's here it is. Here's uh, William Wallace Mitchell. What a great name, William Wallace Mitchell. Is Bill's real name, but it says uh, he says here the neck and the chin of the of Cooper appear appear as if he had been fat and lost weight, leaving some flabby skin. So that's uh, th that's him. And this is him. This is him talking about the Bing Crosby sketch here. He says that uh, the picture makes the makes Cooper look younger than he actually is. Right. So we we know that the Bing sketch looks looks younger than it's supposed to. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's, he's older than that, and that was the big criticism of that. But if Florence lasted, wish I could find it. Where where Florence Schaffner she lasted until about 1976, uh, and she, she eventually said that she could not remember uh, what what this guy looked like by that. But Let's see if I yeah, can. You have the old mystery sketch. Yeah, which is funny. That's what always bugs me, and you know, I. The fact that she drew that sketch is funny because here we have her. Yeah, here we go. Schaffner noted that it has been five years since the hijacking and that she seriously doubted whether whether or not she could identify the individual individual from photos and that she would have to see him in person before making any kind of identification. So Flo lasts until about 76 and says that I that I would have to see the guy in person, that photos, basically she's telling the FBI, don't show me any, don't show me any more photos because I can't, they're of no benefit to me. I, I can't help you out. So that's why I always have to laugh at people who say that, you know, let's show them photos. They, they don't know. Yeah. Yeah. But, it's, yeah. I don't put a whole lot in it I mean, other than maybe it could Tina remember something that never got out, you know, I mean, probably not, but it's, it's, it's a fun thought. That maybe yeah. She yeah. Remembered something that she never told or, or they kept under wraps, you know, that, yeah. And I don't, I, you know, well, I don't know what, you know. Yeah. We, we don't know. It, and people like to, infer mystery onto Tina Mucklow for whatever reason they say she's not cooperating. Well, I like to tell people that we've got two different eras in the Cooper case. We have, it's almost like AD and BC. We have uh, BV and AV, which is before the vault and after the vault releases. So, we, you know, once the FBI files came out, complete 180. And it's not, you know, like, for example, Bruce's book is mostly pre, he did some new editions, but the book is pre-vault. And so, when in, before the FBI files were released, this case was an active case. So you've got the witnesses kind of walking on a tightrope a little bit because the FBI are like, don't say too much because it's active. We know this because there are FBI files that I've seen where they're basically threatening the stewardesses, saying, look, don't say too much because you're going to get, you know, you're going to get in trouble here 
if you say too much. And that's interesting. Yeah, I wish I could find that uh, where that is, but it, it's definitely. I've got that somewhere in my files here, but they did say that to the stewardesses. They said, you need to like shut up about, you know, don't say too much. You know, you, you know, you guys are talking too much and don't, you know, just, just keep your mouth shut. So there's that. Oh yeah. Basically they give them a veiled threat. They say, just letting you know, we can't tell you not to talk to the press, but if anything you say helps the hijacker, you could be prosecuted. So they're, it's kind of a threat to them, right? So before the case was closed, the only evidence that got out was really what people could, guys like Bruce could, could kind of dig out of people. But again, Bruce is digging this out of people 40 years later. So their memories are a little yeah. vague. And, you know, so. The parachute confusion, which you've done a great job of sorting that out because a lot of people like when he gets a Braden or an experienced skydiver, well, he took a dummy shoot. He took a shoot that was sewn shut. Uh, he did not take that shoot, <laughs> you know? And so no. it, it, it yeah. done a lot of good straightening out things like that. Right. You know, it's one of the, one of the myths of the Cooper case was that, you know, that he had a choice between a military shoot and a skydiving shoot, like a civilian. And that's just not true at all. He did not have a choice. Both of his shoots that he was given were old military shoots. They neither were skydiving rigs. And about the dummy shoot, he didn't have those. The dummy shoot was a front reserve, which you can see behind me. I've got the two parachutes there. The smaller one, Cooper, there was no way for Cooper to put that on. So those, those small shoots, the small one clips on to the big shoot. There was no way for Cooper to do yeah. that because the, 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 the rig yeah, that no he was given, he had no D-ring, so he couldn't have even done that. Even if he had wanted to, Cooper couldn't have jumped with a dummy shoot, right? So that's not... But we've got all the, the, but after the vault releases, we have the FBI files from the, from the day of the hijacking, right? We don't need. Yeah. We don't, we don't need somebody's or, memory or from Kossi, 50 years. Or, or, or Kossi or, uh, you know, Norman right. Hayden, what they told Bruce in a barn one day. <laughs> right, right. What we've got is the actual files from, from, when we, I mean, to, to think that we now have files where Tina Mucklow is saying, I can't remember what the guy looked like less than a year afterwards. Yeah, that is a game changer. That's it a, is huge. And, and it is, it is huge job getting it out there. And then you found out or, or through all the, the releases that it was a 24 foot canopy. Yeah. In fact, yes. So Cooper jumped with a, a canopy that pair that paratroopers would have felt comfortable jumping with. That's a you know, small canopy. Yeah. Max V. Sog did use a 24 footer. At least one told me that was one of their choices was a 24 foot. Canopy. Yeah, it was. Yeah. So exactly. So, you know, really he, he was small. not afraid. They're very small. You come down, you come down a lot faster. Um, so, but yeah, Cooper had a choice between a 20 Cooper. If Cooper looked at the packing cards and we think he did, he would have seen that one parachute was a 24 foot canopy and one parachute was a 26 foot canopy. And the 24 foot canopy is going to, you're going to hit harder, but you're going to get to the ground quicker. So if you're fearing chase planes, seeing you yeah, or maybe more for a halo. Right, right. You know, and that's halo. another, I mean, for some of these, Braden, but, but, you know, I know that, that, that Mark has talked before, but maybe Cooper squitted where he would pull the ripcord on the stairs and then let the yeah. parachute fill up and jump. But from what I know, when guys have jumped out of 727s, it's what the thing that blew them away the most is, of course, it's so high up. That they were land, you know, would land nowhere near where they wanted to because the wind will catch it when you deployed the chute that early, and you could, you know, who knows where you're going to land. So pulling late would right. be an advantage if you if he knew where he was. Oh, for to sure. Jump, if he could see lights or or uh, PDX or what whatever, uh, anything near battleground. If there was anything visible through the clouds that he knew that he, you know, get to the ground quicker. Right, and what's interesting is that the FBI. Well, not the FBI. The FBI didn't know a damn thing about parachutes. So that's another thing about the people people need to remember is that the FBI, this was not their wheelhouse. The FBI, when they investigate robberies, it's bank robberies. There are things that they're very well that they that you know the FBI have honed their skills about certain things for a long time. They've been doing bank robberies since the you know since the founding of the FBI. I mean, you got you know. You know, you know, Pretty Boy Floyd and all those people, those bank robbers, right? That's the FBI's doing all that stuff. But they have never, Cooper case was a case of first impression, we call it, in the law. It, it, there was no prior precedent to this. This had never happened before. So, and, and that's why the main reason I think, you know, people say, how did Cooper get away? Well, Cooper got away because they weren't prepared for it. 
you know, he caught them by surprise. And really, that is almost a special forces tactic, really, is it's, it's you know, you do something where they're not, where there's no way anybody can prepare for it yeah, to defend it. Yeah, that's why guys like Bruce were seeking out uh, Mac V. Soggs. But you also have uh, Earl Cossey, who is clearly says in the In Search of documentary, which was, you know, 1979, before the money find, he, he clearly says that, yeah, this is very survivable. But yet he changes his tune later on as, oh, he's a no pull. Uh, you know, what would have caused that? And Cossie, who's the FBI's go to for all things parachutes, changes yeah. his tune. Yeah, like I said, we've got Cossie. We have his words from literally two days after the hijack and saying, yeah, he's going to survive. He might break his ankle or something, but he's going to live at least. And as I've said, I say it a million times. People hear me now. It's like a broken record, but. I, I have I have talked to one of the guys who was there on the ground. I have talked to one of the FBI agents who was there the night of the hijacking. He was there uh, during the searches with the Army in 72. He was there in 73. This guy went and talked to people. He knows all this stuff. His, brain's, his brain is all there. He's in his 80s. And I asked him, I said, what did, did, what did you guys think about Cooper surviving? He goes, oh, we knew he lived pretty much within a week when nobody found a body in their backyard, when nobody saw a parachute in a tree, when there were no vultures circling anywhere in, in the drop zone, we knew he got away. But, you know, what are we going to tell the media? Well, shit, I guess he got away. You know, no, they're not going to say that. They're going to say, oh, he died. This is so dangerous. Yeah, Trying to discourage just... copycats. Copycats. Yeah, and he, had, he, he, had, he had a pretty good laugh because I said, well, that didn't work out too well, did it? Discouraging copycats. He goes, no, yeah, it didn't. Some, yeah. yeah, because... Well, yeah, the, yeah, they they assumed Cooper lived, and again, all the others lived too. You know, we've got uh, Mac, who had never even put on a parachute. You know, jumps with a front reserve, going 330 miles an hour, lives. Great. We've got we've got uh, Richard Lapointe, who we have no evidence had ever. You know, he had parachute training. Richard Lapointe was a door gunner on a Huey in Vietnam, and I learned I did some research and learned that uh, helicopter crews were given parachute training. Because you could jump out at 2,000, 3,000 feet. And, you know, so they, they did wear parachutes some of them, some of the time. So, but LaPointe had never jumped to our knowledge. And LaPointe jumps and lands in the, you know, LaPointe jumps out in January, in January in Colorado wearing cowboy boots and a Western shirt and jeans and lands in the snow <laughs> and lives. You know, we've got Heineman. There's no proof that Heineman had ever jumped. We don't know yeah. that. And Heineman lands in the jungle of Honduras in at nighttime and just Crazy. walks out. So, you know, if done. if Cooper, you know, Ted is a perfect guy to wing this. If this is a guy who could jump into North Vietnam, n not knowing where the hell he was, you know, wiretap the NVA and then get back to South Vietnam somehow. Clark County, Washington is not going to scare this guy on a Wednesday night at eight o'clock, you know he's going to be able to hike back to wherever he parked his car and not worry about it. It's not yeah. going to bother him at all yeah. to do this. At, at all. You know, with Ted, I go back to people that I've talked to that knew him, like Al Tyre, who was a highly accomplished uh, uh, military parachutist, won a lot of, uh, of competitions doing it. And I love the story of Al because he told me, and I wish I recorded it because Al passed away at a stroke a few years ago. Yeah. A really great guy. Uh, he told me when he ran into Bay Braden at the Bowling Green truck stop, Al Tire walks in and he sees Ted Braden at the counter at this, this truck stop. And he said, and he couldn't believe he's, his eyes because he hadn't seen him in years. And he said, mm -hmm. Ted Braden. And he said, Ted jumped like he was scared, <laughs> like a deer in the headlights. Like, who, who me? You know, that, that yeah. whole thing, which is, which is interesting. And then, you know, they, they noticed it was his old friend. They sat and had breakfast there at the truck stop. And then they went into the cab of Braden's truck. And at the time, he was driving for uh, PPG, Pittsburgh Plate Glass. But it was I, he believed it was Ted's rig that he paid for. And Ted asked him, and, and Al told me this. He said, hey, man, what did you think of the D.B. Cooper thing? And Al's like, mm -hmm. D.B. Cooper, like, uh, yeah, the guy that jumped out of the, the, you know, that jumped out of the plane with the 200 grand or whatever. And Al was like, oh, I heard something about it. But Al didn't really, wasn't that into Cooper for whatever reason for a parachutist. And he said, Braden was dejected. When he had that reaction that he wasn't like, oh, D.B. Cooper, uh, and Al yeah. said he was truly dejected. Like he, he like, couldn't believe I wasn't into D.B. Cooper. And, you know, he kind of dropped the subject. And it was later when Al opened up, a, a, I think it was Parachutist Magazine or something like that and saw the D.B. Cooper sketch that he 
believed from then on that Braden was Cooper because he said he just had that smirk. And I was just a believer, you know, like a, a lot of people that knew him personally did. Yeah. And so we've got Alan. This is some general questions here. Uh, he's asking about uh, where he says, uh, does eye color really matter? Uh, Bill said he had his glasses on the whole trip and Tina, did, Tina didn't want to look at his eyes and Florence fled. Um, oh, eye color. On, they're brown, yeah. yeah. I mean, Flo. Yeah. Flo says they're brown. Uh, you know, I, I have no reason to, to, to doubt her. Flo did, as, as I mentioned before, Flo interacted with Cooper, I believe eight times. I counted eight different interactions before he put on his sunglasses that she interacted with him just as a passenger, she greeted him on coming on. The, she greeted him coming onto the plane. She saw him walk across the tarmac, took his ticket or looked at his ticket at least. Um, you know, Flo. You know, Flo saw Flo saw these things. But the thing about Flo though is that what's fascinating about Flo, as far as the eyes go, is that she was of no use describing his eyes. So we've got here these FBI documents that I found. Let me try to put this up here. Um, yeah, this is Flo. So this is, yeah, this is uh, five days after the hijacking. Uh, this agent says he talked to the artist who interviewed one of the stewardesses, the only one who saw the man without glasses, that'd be Flo, and she was unable to definitely recall what his eyes looked like. Um, so they asked all these other people, and I actually made a whole video of that, people, on my channel. Hopefully you've seen that about Cooper's eyes, is that we don't know what they really looked like. We have no idea that the, the eyes in the sketches may as well just be made up. I mean, there's they're just, they're not... You know, they're not there. So, but eye color, Flo was never, Flo never hesitated um, about them being brown. But I would just say dark colored. I mean, darker. And, you know, hazel eyes, like I've got, hazel eyes can be brown. They, they can go, they go between brown and green is what hazel is. So, the eye colors never really bothered me as far as like, now, blue eyes, like I said, like Sheridan Peterson or somebody, no way. Um, yeah, Sheridan has piercing blue eyes. Yeah, let's see. Alan says, anyone else's suspect jumped in North Vietnam, flew, F1, F, flew F-100s, ran a foundry, and became rich and famous in 72. I don't know anybody uh, who, would, who, would, who would have flown and ran a foundry and jumped in North Vietnam. I don't. And one thing to remember, too, is we don't know that usually MACV SOG insertions were done by helicopters. Is that right, Drew? Yeah, yeah they had much, much better aircraft than having to use a 727. I mean, yeah, yeah right. All all kinds of aircraft at their yeah. disposal if, to do the If searches. they had jumped out of a 727, it would have been in Laos or somewhere because they wanted to make they wanted to make the people who were see the aircraft think it was a civilian aircraft. That was the whole purpose of using a 727 to do these clandestine things is that it would appear to just be a 727. You know, and hey, you can't, you know, this is a commercial jet, right? It's not a military jet but they're doing military things. That was the whole purpose, you know? Um, yeah, th that was the whole purpose really for that. Yeah. Uh, Lisa mentions, a, I mean, Lisa does mention it, something interesting. And this is where I wonder if Ted was investigated by the FBI. I mean, maybe they just couldn't do anything with him, but there was a Mac V SOG veteran who claimed that, that uh, they were visited and asked about it uh, at a drop zone in North Carolina and he says it says it was an early 70. Yeah, in early 72, he said that FBI guys showed up and asked them about Braden and specifically. That, specifically about Ted Braden. And that they were like, and he said, Oh, I don't remember the guy because I've just heard about him. Yeah. But there were other weird. guys, but some of, but some of the other guys who were with them were older guys and were like, Oh, yeah, it, it, he could he could he could have done this. You know, sure. That sounds like something he would, you know. Because I mean, Ted was again, Ted was a notable figure. Because, I mean, you know, this guy, I mean, you know, soldiers are going to, you know, shoot the shit. And Ted oh, yeah. was this larger than, he was a larger than life figure in his own time. You know, he was oh, like yeah. they knew he was the god. Yeah, they knew he was, yeah, he was he different. Was over here. You know, it, it, yeah. you know they had some crazy, other crazy guys in, 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 in Magby Sog. There's a guy named Jerry Shriver who was, his nickname was mm -hmm. Mad Dog. I mean, he was really gung-ho. He was un unfortunately killed in Vietnam. Uh, but he was a very gung ho, crazy guy. Uh, did all kinds of stuff. Was a legend too. But, but Braden was like something different of an, a, a, somewhat of an enigma over there. Just so different, you know, the way he thought. Really intelligent, kind of quiet at times, but then had that fiery temper. 
and he just, you know, like he's over here, we're here, you know, he's still different than us. Right. Yeah. I'll open it up real quick before we go. It's been going on for two hours now, but hey, people, if you have any questions, any, any Cooper -y questions, please just general Cooper questions for Drew and I, um, we we both know what we're talking about with the Cooper case. So any general questions, just go, go ahead and, and, uh, and go on. But now Ted, if I like, if I had to like make a Vegas bet, I would, my, I would still put 90% on, we don't know who the guy is yet, but, but that's a reasonable thing to do because there's millions of people it could have been, right? I mean, we well, don't yeah, know. I, I, I agree. You know, I'm a tech yeah. guy. I wouldn't bet my life that he was Stevie Cooper, even though I've talked to some people that said they would. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's a good bet, you know, because there's so many great, you know, there's new suspects I haven't heard before that some people are working on that I'm interested oh, yeah. in. I, I love hearing about them. You know, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong because if I'm ever totally proven wrong, then hopefully I know who the real, you know, the real D.B. Cooper is because, right. you know, like I said, I'm a fan of the case first. Always have been. I just love the, you know, the lure of it. You sure. Know, the, the whole image of the, the glasses and the, just going back like you found it, you know, on watching an old In Search Of or, uh, you know, Unsolved Mysteries. And you just you're hooked at that point. And then at some point you get to the vortex and it's it's a great place. You know, it's like I like you said on Darren's podcast, you don't like true crime because, you know, that's your day job. And yeah, a yeah. Criminal defense attorney. But the Cooper case, you know, at least nobody got killed. I mean, yeah, it was a bad thing that he did, but it's it's a, more guilt free. And, and just something that, that just keeps you occupied trying to figure this out. Guys like you, yeah. me, Eric, uh, Chris, uh, there's so many that are just doing this great stuff. You figured out who the cowboy was. Oh, yeah. I, mean, I, I, I love all the new stuff. And if it, if it goes away yeah, from the dead, hey, great. Because I, all I want to know is where it ends. Yeah, I, I think that there is, I mean, hopefully hopefully the, the author of this up and coming book will let me, I'm going to interview him. And hopefully, hopefully I'll be able to, we, we will bring this new suspect to everyone's attention. Uh, he's a, there's a suspect coming out soon who is a military type person who is, uh, he could give Ted a run for his money as far as circumstantial evidence goes. I would say that. And he is a legitimate suspect. This, this, is, this is a real, this is no, no drill. You know, as I say, it's like, it's like with Ted, Ted's, Ted's no bullshit. Like this, Ted's a legitimate Cooper suspect. Like there's no, it's like I, when I first talked to Drew, I said, look, I, this is, this is, this guy is, this guy fits everything, you know? And in fact, as I've said, I don't know any other suspect that we can say more probable than not new that, that you could jump out of a 727 with a parachute other than Ted Braden. I don't know. So um, let's see, uh, some, here's some questions coming in. Um, Karen, Professor Karen says, Ryan was, was the toe saw book. The only place that describes the drag bag. Uh, yes, sort of. So in, in the actual, in the actual radio transcripts that I was showing, in the radio transcripts I was showing earlier, when Tina, Tina says that, um, he has the, he has the, he has the line, he has line tied around his waist. So she, she mentions him having it around. The, she, she, she doesn't say the bag is around his waist. She goes, he has he has it tied around. He has she says he has it tied around his waist. So that's really so we do have basically her saying this on the radio in re, in real time. Not that he has the bag tied to him, but he has a line tied to his to his waist. So I do think that that's reiterated by uh, by Tussaud, But that is the only place that we know of. But again, Tina Tina's never been asked these things. You know, we don't have any long form interviews. All we have, the you know, time we have Tina talking is, you know, Tina, Tina has never been in the modern era interviewed by a Cooperite. Like, for example, if I were to interview I'd Tina. It. I'd love it if you could interview her. Oh, I'd love it. Oh, yeah. my gosh. If that could happen. <laughs> Tina, if you're watching, get in touch with Ryan, please. Yeah, I'll be friend. I, I'd love to. I mean, these Coopery questions that we have. And what's crazy is I'll bring, I'll bring this up too, is that this is a great one. So, this is the one that was that really bugged me when the FBI files is, is there's no indication that, that this interview ever happened. But we have this interview here where this agent is saying, hey, go back to Tina and ask her these things. It says, uh, in view of her willingness to cooperate and ability to, to recall details, it is recommended that uh, Tina Muckler be, be re-interviewed. Uh, says, we want her to be re-interviewed, blah, blah, blah. 
the questions they wanted to ask her. How did the hijacker secure the money? Did he appear to be going to jump while holding the money by a handle, or did he fix some kind of knapsack arrangement? What was the position of the hijacker when Mucklow last saw him as he left as she left the rear of the airplane? What did the hijacker have around his waist? Was the hijacker attempting to secure himself to the plane? Um, these other things. So, you know, we have the FBI saying, "Hey, somebody go interview Tina Tina Mucklow about these questions." And I'm like, "Please, I wish they had, but there's no evidence that they ever actually." asked her these questions, but yeah, I would ask her these things. Hey, you know, how, how, how did, what is your memory of how the money looked? Was it bundled in bundles of five or bundles of three or loose packets? What, yeah. what did he offer you? She says he offered her, she says that he offered her a, a, a package. That's not, a, it's not a packet. It's not a bundle. It's a package of money. So is that the three pack bundle or is that just one he pulled out did he offer her yeah, so, like so he that he gave her eight hundred dollars you know yeah so we, 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 or... yeah exactly we, th these are things that i'd like to know you know that we don't know these answers to um let's see other questions somebody asked let's see uh we talk a lot about the fbi closing the case in 2016 was it really just about resources and the suspect likely being dead yeah i i think that they were just tired of but as long as the case was active, then they had to be, then they had to answer questions about it. And I think the FBI got tired of the Seattle office being pestered with DB Cooper stuff nonstop and just having to deal with it. I think it was a, a, it was a slog on their resources to have to deal with that. So by closing it, they can just say, Hey, you know, it's closed. Stop, stop asking us questions. And, Generally, I would assume people did. So I, I think it was just about not being bothered. And again, the guy would have been too old by this point. He's, I mean, I believe it was Agent Ng maybe told Tom K or somebody that they weren't going to prosecute him, even if they could, just because what's the point at this point? You know, time, if they, yeah. yeah, and, you know, he's old. And I mean, this guy, again, he wasn't, this isn't like chasing down you know, concentration camp guards who murdered people. This is a guy who scared some people, sure, but the only people who were really hurt, really, was an insurance company that had to pay out some money, you know, in the long run. Um, let's see. Sylvie says maybe Ted wore a toupee. I, you know, I... He did something. He did something. I don't know. It's like you pointed out. One of the mid-70s looks like he's got far more hair than one that was from... Uh, yeah. The one in Vietnam was from 1965, where he looks like he's no no hair there, and it's yeah, he's got doing something. Yeah, a, uh, any chance of a connection between McCoy and Braden? No, uh, I. That, that's Darren's I would like favorite that theory. That's theory. one of Darren's favorite theories is maybe Ted knew McCoy, and I've looked into that. They may have crossed paths at Fort Bragg briefly. Uh, they wouldn't. Yeah. They wouldn't. Have, they wouldn't have crossed paths in Vietnam. I looked at that because McCoy did two tours, and Braden was kind of there, sandwiched in the in the middle of McCoy's two tours. McCoy was over there in 64 with Blacks. Well, I think they did different. Well, I, mean, I guess I was going to say, if McCoy was a helicopter pilot, I guess, I mean, somebody would have done, Ma I, don't, I don't know, Ma I don't know if Mac V. Sog had their own, like, for example, right now, what what are they called? Uh, SOAR or who are the, who are the special forces helicopter pilots now called? Um, I'm not sure. They had Covey. Yeah. They, they had, uh, you know, they're different names for them, but, they, they, well, I'm thinking they about their own. Well, I'm thinking about in like Black Hawk Down, for example. Like you know, those helicopter pilots weren't regular army guys. You know, they were special forces helicopter pilots. Now McCoy wasn't one of those. You know, now McCoy was a Green Beret. I was a Green but, Beret on his first tour. Yeah. So, but yeah, they didn't cross paths. So, and again, I don't think that. Yeah, it's a cool theory, though. Let's see. Uh, Brian yeah. Lisa says, "Could you please talk about the status of the hair slide?" I don't know. Um, the FBI, I looked it up. They said that they said that they have sent me some information about the hair slide. I have not received that in the mail yet. I don't think I, I maybe it ended up in the dead mail. So I, I'm going to contact them tomorrow and say, Hey, you need to resend that. Yes. Yeah, SOAR it's called special forces aviation regiment. That's what, that's what they are. Yeah. So that's who SOG and them would have used probably the special oh, forces guys there. Yeah. Um, hey Packer, who was the mad doctor suspect? The mad doctor suspect uh, was, is, uh, what's his face? J James Roman, who was the guy who murdered his wife's lover, then killed her, then killed himself 
a week before the money is found on Tina Barr. And he does this in, in Vancouver, Washington. He lived in Washougal. Um, you know, he was a test pilot. He was a jet pilot in the 50s, became a doctor, a maybe not even a real doctor. Because when he died, when he killed himself and killed his wife, killed his wife's lover in 1980, and they went to his house in Washougal, they found hidden in the barn dynamite, blasting caps, forging equipment for forgery. They found forged documents, forged medical certificates, um, police scanners, uh, all, all kinds of really creepy things this guy had. And this was a guy who was there in Vancouver in 71. And suddenly in 72, here he is. This is a picture of him here. There's a picture of him in, with his military haircut. This a picture of him wearing a little skinny black tie in, yeah, in 69. Kind of, Look at his neck there, Drew. Stocky. Got yeah, he's the got, the, got the neck going. Yeah, he's got the you know, it got the head shape, but he's got yeah. There, that's a uh, Dr. James Roman there. He, that's it. That, that's him again. But he was at NASA. He had trained. He tried to be a Mercury astronaut. And there's actually a, a, a photo of him with Michael Collins, which is really oh. neat. Yeah. So he tried to be an astronaut, but you know, flunked out. And he was actually a Belgian extraction. His mother was American, and his dad was from Belgium. Um, oh, he's got the so, name. He does, he does, and he was and he was a test pilot. So obviously, you know, his blood pressure would be pretty low in any circumstance. Mm -hmm. So you know, he's a test pilot and was a madman. He performed surgery one time. He was performing a kidney surgery and sliced off and sliced off a woman's breast during a kidney surgery. Oh. So it's like, Ooh. was he even a real doctor? Because this is a guy who had all these forging equipment. Yeah. He was. yeah. So, yeah, Dr. James Roman's his name. And he ends up, like I said, ends up killing himself. And, you know, the FBI or the, the Sheriff's Department calls the FBI saying, hey, this guy's got, I mean, this guy's pretty close to D.B. Cooper's age, too. He was, uh, Roman would have been 43 or 44 at the time. So, right in the right age. And he was 5'11", so he's right height, you know. And he's just mad. This guy who clearly was living a double life of some sort. And would have known airplanes, would have known parachutes from being, you know, a, a test pilot and, you know, had nerves of steel and obviously was a bit of a madman, you know? So that, that's James Roman. Let's see. Yeah, uh, gotta, it's a good one. Yeah, that, yeah, that's a good one. So anyway, all right, let's see. I think I'm going to wrap it up there. We've got, uh, uh, that's about it. So, all right, folks. Well, uh, I appreciate you joining us in this. We've had our, our, our Ted Braden discussion who I do think if, if you add it up, if you had a list of, you know, check marks for what you want with Cooper, he's going to have the most of any suspect I've ever encountered. Um, and you get major bonus points for knowing that you can jump out of a 727 out the back of it. That is, that's, you get, I mean, that's, that's, you get huge bonus points for that. Any yeah, suspect. And, it's, and it's you like, can take off with the air, with the stare down. Yeah. He knew these things. This is a, you know, so, and he's got the, this guy would not have been scared to jump out at night. He's just, and he was a master criminal. I mean, again, you've got this guy who, just think about it again. I'll end with this. You have one of the best skydivers or one of the best parachutists in the world. Literally, it's not, it's not hyperbole to say that. Literally, one of the best in the world who is driving a truck God knows where at the time of the hijacking who also happens to be a master criminal who gets away with crimes very easily in the hundreds of thousands of dollars range. And let off. This, yeah, this is not Dwayne Weber That's shoplifting. Oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah, Dwayne yeah. Weber was shoplifting Kool Aid at a at a Piggly Wiggly, apparently, according to. I mean, you know, this isn't that. This is a guy who's doing this on high dollar crimes. Amazing skydiver, possibly in the area at the time. We don't know the right age, has a lot of the right complexion, things like this. And so he's about as good as you can get, really, as far as the circumstantial evidence goes. So anyway, yeah, thank you, Drew. Back, and yeah, going back real quick. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go real ahead. quick, it's, it's like you said, like, if, well, surely they would have shown the, the pictures to the stews. Well, if they identified Braden, uh, you'd have to arrest him. And you can't let him Yeah, out, right. So now he's known. So that's kind of my thought. Like, they wouldn't even get that far. Like, don't even just shut this guy down. Yeah, we don't even know that. I mean, and that's yeah. So I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know if they ever saw him. I mean, I would love it 
possibly now that we're getting into the suspect files, release the suspect files are being released now. Uh, for the next seven years, six, seven years, we're going to get suspect files. I mean, obviously, if there's one that's for Ted, you know, knowing what, no, as biographers of Ted, we, we'd be able to recognize the know. details. Yeah, I'll let you know, but I'm not holding my breath, honestly, because I don't, yeah. I just don't think so. But at any rate, okay, folks, well, good night and uh, cheers and adios, amigos. We will talk to you again soon. Bye. Thanks, See you, bud. See you, man.